All right. I do believe we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Break the Rules live stream. I am your host, Lev Polyakov. We're doing it again. I know you guys are starving for the Yarvin, and we have Curtis Yarvin back with us today with the great and powerful counterpoints. And we are going to be talking about Russia versus Ukraine, one of the most oh, favorite sh- subjects. Oh, yeah. One of the most mm-hmm. favorite subjects in BTR history. All the amazing episodes full of love and kindness and uh, friendship that we've had based around this uh, wonderful topic. But I'm going to start it uh, from a very particular thing, from a uh, article that you yourself wrote, Curtis, which is from Me. the uh, Gray Mirror. Everybody make sure to subscribe to Gray Mirror. It's called That's Ukraine. That's graymirror.substack.com. Gray yes. with an A, the American way. And I'm yes, Curtis it is. Yarden. And uh, and what's very important here is the, uh, uh, I'd say, the subtleties in digging through your wonderful uh, article and trying to figure out what exactly makes sense and what does not. So one of the things that you wrote here had to do with Russia going to Africa, which I personally see as a bit of a red herring, and this is kind of why I now, want to now start. Now, what, what, yes. when was this piece written? I, I read a lot of stuff on, on the subject. February so 15th. February Got 15th. It. Okay, fairly recent then. Fairly recently, yes. So this part when you were talking about Russia going into Africa, I believe it was kind of, at least from my perspective, a uh, red herring because you mentioned Moldova and you also mentioned Georgia, but you saved kind of Africa for the piece de resistance for people to kind of gaze at. Just my assumption. I could be completely wrong mm-hmm. because Africa is pretty distant in the minds of a lot of people compared to some of these other uh, countries. I mean, people know what Africa is, but in terms of the culture and all that, you know, it couldn't be further sure. away. Sure. I mean, do we want to go into what Wagner Group is doing in Africa? Do we... Not necessarily right now. I want to focus on the straight and narrow, which for me is what exactly happens if, let's say, Ukraine loses. Because this has been a big Mm. thing for me, where if you're talking about, well, Africa, you know, who cares? You know, let them go into Africa or whatever. But then if we actually take a look at something like uh, Georgia... Georgia has access into Turkey, Turkey's not nuked up, and that could be a passage into Europe, and Moldova, you know, even easier for talking about a passage into Europe. And that's been always the big concern for me when it comes to, you know, if we leave morals aside, if we're talking strictly uh, real politique over here, what needs to be prevented, in my opinion, is Russia getting uh, further amounts of rest if, let's say, the uh, war stops for a bit of time, then starting to encroach again and again into Ukraine, then eventually getting Ukraine, then into other parts of Europe, because I really don't see them stopping. So that's my position. But I want counterpoints to also talk about where he stands, and then yourself, Curtis, and let's let's get it on. And everybody be sure to like, hit that bell, subscribe to Break the Rules, the greatest podcast series of all time. Anyway, counterpoints, go right ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think we might have hit upon this last time if we were talking about, like, uh, needing a dictator or American empire or, like, the limits of government and all that kind of stuff last time we talked. Uh, basically, a lot of people can accurately, I think, point out that America is, like, a transnational corporate, you know, $65 trillion if you include all our allies' uh, hegemon. And that's what we're really defending. We're not defending the integral borders of Ukraine. We're not defending the integral borders of the United States. So that's what we're really going after. Can I object to that just slightly? Sure. Uh, My my slight objection to your, when you talk about hegemon, you're using sort of the language of a critique of, of authoritarianism, of monarchism, really. And you're talking about sort of the United States and its, and its empire as a unitary actor in many ways, because you're political, have a political language for sort of attacking monarchy and not for attacking oligarchy. And so it's sort of more correct to call, it's sort of a non-hegemonic hegemon because it's sort of the rule of this transnational civil society that we're all kind of vaguely familiar with. Does that sound, does that seem about right? Is that? Yeah, and I mean, we can get into yeah. the details of that. Davos but just whatever, right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Davos and uh, what, what is the... Uh... What's their little thing? The, the World, World Economic, Economic Forum. Forum. You believe the, the box. Economic, no, you that believe is Davos. In the yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 so yeah. Eat, eat the bugs, you'll own nothing, and you'll be happy, blah, blah, blah. Sure. So, and so, you yeah, wouldn't so get to drink no this. Center. You wouldn't get to drink there's this no delicious raw anywhere. milk, by the way. This is completely raw milk from the local cow, and um, the Davos group does not want you to have this because this will give you superpowers. But anyway. Yeah, right. and also it's non-pasteurized. Yeah. <laughs> In a month or two, he'll be rooting for Putin. It has this effect. It just give it time. Like <laughs> The milk? <laughs> Okay, so so yeah, so then it becomes a question of balance of power between like this multi uh, power world, how you view elites. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about creating an essay about this, um, and then you know it's also how 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 do you view Russia? So uh, like a lot of the countries or whatever they they position themselves as like anti imperial because they're like resisting the WEF, uh, you know, world hegemonic classless, not, not classless, but a transnational polite society or whatever. Um, so it's a question of whether or not you buy that and whether or not you view it as like exhausting the power of this giant uh, nefarious super organization. And um, yeah, that's really what I guess I want to get into is like whether or not it's good or bad that we have a $65 trillion transnational unelected organization that's kind of running things. Um, and then also, do the people who are standing against it, are they actually like these, uh, you know, David and Goliath characters where they're David standing against the evils of the world? Or are they really just selfish, ruthless bastards who just don't want to bend the knee? Um, so, yeah, we can start there. Uh, OK, OK. That's, let me let me take sort of those two perspectives in together in a way, because I think your perspective counterpoints sort of has almost a Chomskyan kind of flavor to it, which, you know, we'll get into, uh, you know, whether you would attribute that or not. I sort of smell, I'm kind of, kind of get into the kind of Chomskyan-ness of it. Whereas uh, Lev, um, um, are you familiar with the concept of domino theory? It was a, it's a World War, a okay. Vietnam War era kind of idea. You know, mm -hmm. once, once we let them get into Laos, they'll get into Cambodia, then they'll be in Thailand and then they'll take India, yeah. you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and, and we recognize domino theory as a kind of retread of World War II theory. And, you know, again, I'm hearing the sort of kind of Putler theory of Putin. And, and it really, like, it reminds me of, if, if you go back and read sort of the current of informed American opinion, the ancestors of Davos man, which is a thoroughly Anglo-American phenomenon, even if it's in, you know, a beautiful central, beautiful Western Europe. Um, you know, the ancestors, the American ancestors of the international community in 1940, you know, which by which I mean people like Dean Acheson and George Marshall, you know, after the fall of France to Hitler, we're kind of running around screaming that the Western Hemisphere is next. You know, the thing is, France has fallen in France. OK, it's just France, but there's all this French territory in Africa. And Africa is actually very close to they even fit into each other, fits right into Brazil. And so once Dakar becomes Nazi Dakar and we have this new like Nazi Africa, right? Just the, the specter of a Nazi Africa. That's like a movie itself right there. Right. You know, and and time. you have you have you have and then but but it's only a short step from from Dakar to Rio. And so you'll basically see a trans Pacific invasion there. And then the Panzers, of course, having taken Brazil, are going to gradually grind north. Well, you know, the um, like later when we learned uh, about the actual capacity of militaries in that era and we learned how hard it is to cross, for example, the English Channel, we basically sort of learned what an outrageous kind of work of fantasy this was. Furthermore, when we actually, you know, the regime from that period that we understand by far the best is in fact the Nazi regime because we captured all of its documents and people and okay, some documents and things were destroyed. And, you know, no, you know, uh, it always struck me, you know, in Nuremberg, Germany is being prosecuted for two things. One of them is plotting to take over the world, which was sort of the narrative 
under which the war was fought. And then subsequently it was kind of discovered because it had been kind of swept under the rug at the time, these enormous atrocities and murders that they'd committed, which were actually very comparable in some ways to World War I allied propaganda, but with the initial, you know, additional complication that they were actually true. And so it was a while before sort of the concept of the Holocaust as a like specific ethnocide kind of came into vogue. But, you know, when we talk about Hitler's many crimes against humanity, uh, we are on the firmest historical ground. However, when we talk about Hitler's plot to conquer the world, not one single trace of any such plot has ever been found. There was certainly a plot to conquer Eastern Europe. And one of the reasons there was a plot to conquer Eastern Europe is one of the reasons why sort of the kind of integrated plan of Hitler, who was kind of a nut, who was very much like a 4chan Nazi in some ways, he's really a figure completely out of his time. He's not like, most Nazis are like, kind of a Nazi stereotype, but like Hitler is just like this like art fag basically. And, and, you know, why this works though, is that under all the sort of muddy, bad poetry rhetoric of Lebensraum, Germany has a very specific strategic problem. If it wants to be, a you know, an equal in a multipolar world, this is a world that has been disappearing since Waterloo, essentially. If Germany wants to be an equal in a multipolar world as it is on paper, it needs to be self-sufficient in food. And it is not self-sufficient in food unless it either Eastern Europe is a satellite of Germany, or it is a not a satellite of an alliance opposed to Germany. And so Whoa. there's this very strategic objective in basically conquering Eastern Europe, which is not really matched by any strategic demands on Brazil or like panzer divisions on the Rio Grande or whatever. And so moreover, you know, so so when we look at basically Lev's, you know, hypothesis of not only, you know, do we have to look at domino theory and kind of I mean, the dominoes in Southeast Asia did fall, but uh, they didn't fall all the way to like India. And then, you know, yeah, can I, um, can I, yeah, can counter I points. counterpoint, and, got a counterpoint. OK, yeah. So, yeah, so I want to answer this. So so I actually so I agree with you here that like I don't think that the Russians would actually want to take Western Europe geographically. Because one, all the people would be resistant to their rule. Two, their military logistics infrastructure couldn't support that kind of thing. Three, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't think they have any kind of like cross-cultural. I don't think they have any like Lebens, Lebens round, uh, you know, kind of similar manifest destiny to rule Western Europe. Uh, what well, I do you know, think the thing is, it's. Can I interrupt there and just state the very clear motivation for the war, right. in my opinion, which is the motivation of most of the adversaries in um, sort of the Anglo-American wars of the last two centuries, which is I feel that Putin felt extremely backed into a corner. If he had had aggressive intentions in 2014, he could have taken the whole of Ukraine without any trouble whatsoever or with almost minimal trouble because the Ukrainian army was a very was limited ready. capacity at that time. Moreover, you know, in simply reversing the illegal coup of 2014, he, you know, by military force, protecting the legitimate elected, you know, administration administration against the American, um, you know, deputy under secretary Victoria Newland, who's out there among the rioters handing out cookies. Imagine if the Russian ambassador had been handing out cookies on January 6th. Uh, imagine if January 6th had then taken over the government. And then, you know, like what, you know, like and so, you know, the, the idea that that the Ukraine, you know, in this conflict is sort of, you know, chosen to become anything but kind of a hand of this kind of very aggressive power. What you're basically seeing is that Putin is biting because he feels very much backed into a corner. He sees this kind of anti-Russia, which is going to be culturally superior to his Russia, being constructed and militarily armed to the teeth against it, being constructed directly on its frontiers. You know, the the very much the example would be if like, you know, Putin built had sort of taken over Canada in a coup a pro-white coup, let's say, you know, Canada, there's a pro-white regime in Canada funded by Putin, militarized, armed by Putin. This is an openly racist regime 
Um, it has all kinds of restrictions on black people, just like there are all kinds of restrictions on Russian speaking Russian in the Ukraine, in which Russian was the universal language of the entire country, uh, excepting basically kind of rural and backward areas, uh, i.e. outside the cities, uh, you know, uh, until the fall of the Soviet Union. OK, so we have this basically racist KKK controlled anti-Canada uh, being constructed on our frontiers. Um uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, you know, funding misinformation, racism, you know, all kinds of bad things inside the U.S. It's inciting basically all kinds of disaffected kids who it's funding inside the U.S. to like do racisms like, you know, yeah, like that would basically if I was a lib under those circumstances, I might feel a little bit backed into the corner and I might basically be like, you know, when I judge Putin's actions by the standards of the last existing multipolar order, if you go, for example, and read Vattel's Law of Nations and you're like, OK, you know, is Putin justified in invading the Ukraine according to Vattel's Law of Nations? Yeah, he very much well is. And and so, you know, the sense that he's operating under a system of rules, which is not our system of rules. Uh, you know, when our system of rules is basically unilateral submission to the State Department is like, OK, yeah, um, you know, it still leaves sort of a very possible world where we're just like, OK, you know what? It's none of our business if you want to just do a frickin Anschluss with Ukraine. Go ahead. Take the whole of Ukraine. Moreover, you know, our feeling is that the Germans are more than bad and ass enough to defend themselves against you. And maybe they should have to. I think it'll be good for them. And so therefore, not only are we cutting off, you know, funding to this collapsing is the, is tell me, Lev, is the Ukraine out of shells? Is there like the because one of those didn't one of those documents suggest that they were basically kind of uh, you know, there was no longer a buffer, as we say in computer science, in their kind of shell supply. As our uh, dear friend Christopher Caldwell pointed out in that article that you linked, talking about how doomed Ukraine is and how illegitimate this entire operation is, mm -hmm. Ukraine is armed by the West, the United States, other mm -hmm. nations. It's armed in terms of its intelligence as well as missiles. So if the missiles keep a flowing, then Ukraine's going to keep it going. Now I sure. want to I want to quickly add one more thing and then I got to let Yeah, let me just talk. one let me just summarize sure. what I okay. just said by saying that the action of Putin is basically the reason why we act besides, you know, the ridiculousness of of Putin's, you know, T90s going all the way to the channel. Uh, you know, the fundamentally what's going on with Putin is that this is what's called fear biting when you're training an animal. This is basically the behavior of an animal that is very much feels backed into the corner and is defending its autonomy in every possible way. If there was any way to disrespect the autonomy of these autocracies more, you know, without outright invading them, I honestly can't imagine it. And, and so, you know, basically when you interpret that predilection as the cause of these wars, you see that like, you know, high six figures of deaths are basically attributed to a bunch of policies made by people in the seventh floor of the State Department, you know, or what they call desk, desk murderers. And not the Ukrainians you know, the, themselves, who uh, the State Department, uh, at least from what I understand, wanted, Listen, to, give, wanted to give up. I'm I'm heard, very happy of the to be pamper of, of Hamelin. Uh, he, listen, uh, listen, 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 yeah. listen, listen. I'm very happy to be in a room with such high IQ individuals, but I also like to think of myself as smart, and I do want the opportunity to speak at some point. <laughs> yes, count the right, points. Sorry, 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 sorry. I'm belaboring, I'm belaboring okay. you. No, it's the the point is like I I think that like we could move past. Not, we don't have to move past, but but we can like kind of get on descriptive even footing where, uh, you know, I could just concede instantaneously that if a country was acting as a rival to the United States and was doing what the United States was doing, I'm not saying that we would like physically invade Mexico or Canada, but we wouldn't, we would be taking every single diplomatic, economic, probably bordering military action in order to upset those plans. 
Um, and then the question kind of becomes like when we're looking at, you know, th this global order or whatever, we look at kind of like whether or not it's legitimate, whether or not it brings benefits and whether or not those benefits outweigh the costs and whether or not Russia should be trying to become a part of that order rather than resisting it. And I don't think it's as clear cut as like, you know, making appeals to autonomy, because if you make appeals to autonomy of like, oh, well, they should have just like this, like voluntarist decision of whether or not they want to join. And if they say no, that's that. And we just have to respect their sovereignty after that. I don't think that's how, you know, uh, global geopolitics has ever worked. I think that people have machinations about what they plan for the world and they try to implement those machinations and other people have counter machinations that they try to implement and so on and so forth. So just to just to give you the steel man real quick before I let you go, just to give you the steel man to the dominoes theory of like Western Europe falling to, you know, Russian, you know, fucking Soviet era tanks and shit. I don't think that's possible or even probable. Uh, what I do think is instead possible or probable is that if uh, America, if the United States of America was toothless in its engagement with Ukraine, um, if we did have a president who backed out of NATO, if we did have Western European allies that were uh, you know, underprepared for any kind of like military conflict in Europe, as we do now, despite the fact that we see that they're militarizing now, um, you know, then what could happen is the Eastern orbiters like Latvia and Estonia, which I don't have, I have no idea how the fuck they ended up in NATO, but somehow they're in NATO now. You could see those guys say, well, we feel the wind shifting. We know the United States isn't going to back us. And we know that Western Europe isn't going to back us. So as a result, we're going to open up more aggressive uh, military and diplomatic and economic relationships with Russia. And then you would basically see the recoalescence of the Eastern Bloc. So I, I think that's more likely than the the kind of uh domino theory we were talking about all right let's go let's go it for an, you know an, an intermediate you know like like there's sort of two questions here like what maybe three questions what could putin do what should putin do what will putin do unfortunately you know i think they all all three of them have different answers and um well i don't you know i certainly i certainly you know because of the way I, the united states played it First of all, you know, I'd like to inquire, you know, um, counterpoints when you use you use this word ally. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering in what sense you mean the word ally. Do you mean to imply that there's a kind of symmetry there or do you view the word ally as in some sense a euphemism for a word like, um, you know, puppet or satellite? Uh, you know, and if you prefer, if you don't think of it a, as think of it as a euphemism, can you identify other cases in which it is a euphemism, or do you feel that the word is never a euphemism? Because no, I, okay, you refer yeah, to the I word think... empire and so on and so mm. forth. Yeah, so so I yeah. think that there's willing and unwilling nations who have their own interests. So, for instance, I think Ukrainian nationalists have their own interests. I think uh, Ukrainian citizens have their own interests when it comes to whether or not they want to join the global hegemonic empire of the United States. And by and large, I think their answer is pro. The reason why I think it's pro is because I could bring up the examples that you're thinking of, of uh, or that I'm thinking of when you say, are you thinking ally or are you thinking puppet? When I think puppet, I think Afghanistan and Iraq. I think of Afghanistan, which fell in 11 days after the United States left it. And I think of Iraq, uh, which uh, they basically ceded 50 percent or 30 percent of the country within a few months of some dudes in pickup trucks showing up with AK-47s. I would view, view those as corrupt puppet regimes. But when I see like, you know, Ukrainians with relatively high morale, with relatively decent weaponry, with relatively decent, you know, kill counts, I know we're, you know, somebody was saying seven to one, but then you actually look at the numbers in the documentation and it's more like, uh, you know, it's more like 60, 40 split casualty stats. I, I think that, you know, Ukraine could surrender at any point and prove your puppet theory. I don't think they have. Well, you know, does your does your theory of of motivation 
extend to wartime Japan and Germany because, you know, the citizens of those countries were both very, very enthusiastic about the battles that they were fighting. They really believed in them. And then when the power over them was changed, their minds were changed. And so the thing is, I, I feel like your sort of political epistemology always treats public opinion as a cause and when you always treat public opinion as a cause you're kind of going to miss all of the forces that treat it as as an effect you know when we say for example that the you know ukrainians you know believe in their fight as did confederates and you know uh, many other losing forces in the past you know one way to ask the question of you know First of all, like, you know, if if we don't think of public opinion as a sort of magic connection to God, which is kind of the sort of Yankee Puritan way uh, of thinking about it, kind of in the democratic, you know, tradition, we're forced to ask where it comes from and where it comes from, you know, it, when we're tracing where public opinion on a matter as important as, for example, should we have... Um, a war with the Russians, um, or should we surrender to Russia? Um, you know, that's obviously a choice that the Ukrainians had. Incidentally, as you may know, Zelensky himself was elected on a peace platform. You, you realize that he was the he was the like, no, let's not have a war with Russia candidate, which is somewhat ironic. And what he found was that he could not resist the collective Nationalist. force of both the very violent, you know, um, you know, Azov, uh, you know, to his right and Victoria Newland to his left. And and so but he, he could have no evacuated choice. at any time, though. That's the other thing. They gave oh, him yeah, a chance yeah. to I'm run sure he and he been, didn't run. Know, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, the the um, you know, we should, um, you know. So um, what, what um, was that? Was that like Victoria maybe, Newland, like uh, grilling him in the background, saying, uh, maybe, "Well, you're you're you know, going to pretend." Maybe he pretend. likes to be. Uh, maybe he likes to be on on TV. He certainly hasn't been shelled. And if you if you said Ukrainians, for example, on you know January first, twenty twenty two, are you familiar with the Monty Hall problem? No, it's <laughs> like this famous intelligence test. Like there's a you know three doors. And, you know, between, uh, you know, uh, behind one of them is a sack of gold and behind the other two was a goat, you know, and they open one door and you see the goat and then you're like, OK, do you change your, your mind? Right. So imagine it's January 1st, 2022, and you are the people of Ukraine and you are granted omniscient wisdom and you see that you have two obvious choices you can take. And one of them is to take the path that you are currently on, and this path will lead to the devastation of your country and hundreds of thousands of deaths. And you can see that the other path, you don't know what it is, but it probably involves becoming a tributary of Russia, and thus you will fall under the rule of Putin and a bunch of like tracksuited corrupt thugs, and rather than a bunch of Harvard educated corrupt thugs, uh, you know, which had a lower rating in Transparency International before the war. I don't know, but Ukraine was really, I think it was widely considered one of the most corrupt countries in the world because it was like, you know, a, a sort of, you know, oligarchy of thieves, uh, but without a Vojd, you know, to, uh, to, to keep it in line. I think Putin is actually very weak you know, leader by Russian standards, but that's neither here nor there. Now, if you had that choice, basically, and I think the choice would be fairly obvious, and I think you would say, wow, you know, anyone who would make this choice wrong, that's a very dangerous way to think, why would we be thinking this way? And so whenever your decisions vary from hindsight, you know, the, from how they would be made in hindsight, you've been, you know, made a fool of. And you've done I something I don't think that that's is... how geopolitical decisions are made at all. <laughs> Wait, think. what? Like, I'm not saying this is, this is, this is just logic, man. This has nothing to do with how, uh, you know, decisions are made. It's, it's mm. basically a way of defining if you basically, you know, would go back, whatever your decision-making mechanism is, if you would go back in the past and be shown the consequences of those decisions, that decision, 
and then not change your mind. For example, let's say you look at no, no, you know, Curtis. All right, listen, 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 buddy. Sure. I, I I love you dearly, and I appreciate your insights, and I find you an intelligent and fascinating person to speak to. But I also want the ability to rebut. Okay, um, please. So yeah, so so basically, like here here's the thing: you're you're looking at the past six months of hindsight, and you're just like presuming that it's a goat. And uh, if a goat is like a metaphor for something that's very not a bag of gold, then, you know, OK. I think considering then, the number of people killed. Okay, I would like to finish. A, OK, so, yeah, I'd like to finish a thought. So the so basically here, but you don't know the long term trajectory of this. And it's very clear, like, like basically the long term trajectories of each society. So if you were to look at like Western societies, which you can be more skeptical on than I am, there's at least the veneer or the ideology of some level of transparency or democracy or capitalism or free market enterprise and all that kind of crap. You can you can be cynical and say it's a veneer, but there's at least the veneer. And along with that veneer come certain economic benefits, for instance, access to the Western European market. Now, it does come with some negative things like so, for instance, there's lots of gays and blacks and browns and all that kind of stuff, you know, that come along with free market capitalism and the liberal hegemon but all in all people enjoy pretty decent quality of life so for instance like i'm talking to you on a computer while playing video games and i just eat you know uh peanut butter m ms that were harvested from some poor slave bastard in south america that's a part of this global hegemonic market uh you know versus like i don't know eating like potato you know potato fucking soup schlop before i schlup off to like some orthodox fucking church to pray to like putin so my point here is that like we can we can like very cynically wave at all the material benefits of a relationship with the west but it actually does necessarily impact people's lives and the way that they interact with the world and these are positive and negative i'll wrap this up i promise so basically, like you're saying, like, OK, well, the Ukrainians have been bamboozled because they look at, you know, half a million dead or whatever. And there's, you know, uh, 250,000 or 300,000 dead Russians or whatever. It's been a disaster for everybody. You know, uh, the, the southeastern and southern part of the country has been absolutely fucking devastated. But we don't know what this is going to look like in 10 or 20 years, 10 or 20 years from now. They could have been stuck in a fucking shitty orbit with a kleptocracy, like a, a shitty neo feudal russian fucking empire that is still being a kleptocratic fucking shithole 20 years from now whereas the ukrainians could be you know well on their way to gay luxury fucking lgbtq low birth rate uh jerking off in the fucking pod <laughs> capitalism so you know so so basically like and you know you can look down that future and see all the necessary negatives of it right but at the same time, just because like our, our overlords are pushing us to jump into the masturbation machine as they pump bug paste into our veins, as they put like a low level of opiates in front of us. And we watch, uh, if you've seen Idiocracy, you know, we're, we're watching a loop of owl my balls. That doesn't actually mean that that's the future of the Western world. That can be the extrapolated <laughs> future, but I don't think that's actually the future. Well, you know, all I could say is that... Um... <laughs> I've heard uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> that was amazing. Like that has to be like the transcript for that has to be like taken somewhere. Like that's a you know, this is a historic rant. All I can say is that you know, um, you've heard of the concept of a trolley problem, right? You know, yeah. um, I feel that I can think of better like justifications for killing half a million people. Like you know, I feel like if I had to justify killing that many people like i could probably i would want something that sounded maybe a little bit stronger especially than the and conclusion that gay, you kind of wind up with luxury right? <laughs> and, um, world. and so so you know this may yeah. be like a minority mm. opinion that i have here right you know i'm not sure how mm. readers but but again we're looking at like the like kill half a million people and get the gay you know bug paste what, what the gay well, bug paste on. thing what the <laughs> gay <laughs> bug yeah. paste thing though so i gotta okay. i gotta i gotta point out something that you're loading right. here okay so so when th this is something that leftists do that kind of frustrates me where they, they'll talk about like all the the evils of capitalism and all the dead people and all that kind of stuff and they, they'll just like they'll they'll spit out the number and they'll spit out how oh like iraq perfect example like a million dead in the iraq war right but the thing that they're not mentioning is that like 90 percent of the casualties in the iraq iraq war were inter-ethnic, inter-religious, uh, like rival factions slaughtering the shit out of each other and not the United States walking up and executing Iraqi civilians for shits and giggles. So there was a moral choice uh, on behalf of all the belligerents that it's okay to go out to the helicopter view and take a look down and see like, well, right. the United States caused this conflict, everybody's dead as a result. 
But when you actually go down to the ground and you talk to those people, those people are saying like, no, like we were Sunni, we were previously in power, right. we've been dispossessed, Shia militias came to our neighborhood, saying, they started slaughtering us. Yeah. What you're saying, what you're saying, counterpoints. You know where I'm going. Basically, yeah, right. Were, were you in, were you in Iraq? Were you? Uh, yeah, uh, I, you know, I, yeah, I deployed during the surge. What you're yeah. what you're basically what you're basically saying is like it's you know this is a trolley problem right here, you know, and and what you're saying is that it's fine that you like laid the tracks and like built the trolley and like released the brakes and set the trolley going, but like Haji is driving the trolley, so it's fine. Is that like? Uh, no, because basically what's happening is is you have the United States trying to build like a trolley while a bunch of hotties are you know building their trolleys, and then all the <laughs> I apologize are... for using that word. I shouldn't. I shouldn't do no, that it's fine. Podcast. And then they're uh, and then it's, they're slamming so into dated each other. that I thought that no one would have yet, but uh... <laughs> no, no, it's fine. But but then like the the trolleys like slam into each other and turn into shrapnel and like shotgun uh -huh, blast uh -huh, into uh -huh, like uh -huh. interior crowds and stuff. And you're just like so, you know I could have just left the Ottoman Empire here. And it would have well, been well, okay, but could, but, but, could but you exactly, you're just the... like, you're just like, you know, you're, no, you're, no, no, you're like, this is... you have to fuck with it. Like, just well, no, this is a real question. It. This is, yes. this is, okay, this is a real question, though. So, so for instance, like the Ottoman Empire was like the old sick man of Europe or whatever up until like the 1910s and all that kind of stuff. And if you look at like the history of like the 19th century and 18th century of the Ottoman Empire, it's all like the inter ethnic, inter linguistic, you know, and inter religious, like yeah, tribal strife who, that's rotting it out from is, the core. Who is already stoking? You're basically repeating Anglo American propaganda from the late 19th century. Who is already stoking those fires? Who, for example, there's a great essay by by the British historian Eli Kadouri, who was a Baghdad Jew. Um, it's in a book called The Chatham House Version. And he takes this very interesting take on the Armenian genocide, uh, you know, which is must be particularly poignant coming from like a Baghdad Jew. He's, of course, which is a community that, that like so many of these fucking communities no longer exist. Uh, you know, as uh, George W. Bush said, nice job, Brownie. Heck of a job, Brownie. Uh, you know, and, 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 you know, Kadori, who is a, you know, he's a historian, um, is basically looking at this kind of conventional narrative from the British Arabists, uh, you know, which he describes as the Chatham House version. Chatham House, of course, being the British version of our good friend, the Council on Foreign Relations. And essentially, he's like, OK, you know, here we have this narrative of the Armenian genocide, which is absolutely true. The Armenians really do get genocide. It's really fucking awful and horrible. Moreover, the worst thing about it, which people fail to mention often, is that actually, of course, we still have Armenians in Armenia, but they're just like considerably inferior to the Levantine Armenians who got genocided. It's like genociding like the entire U.S. East Coast and all, all that's left is like Appalachia. Right. It's just like these are like a much lower grade of Armenian. But but, uh, you know, the which you can sometimes distinguish whether the name by whether it's an IAN or a YAN. But I digress. Anyway, the Armenian genocide is real. It happened. And, you know, but then the question arises, why? Why did the Turks genocide the Armenians? Did they just wake up one morning after having lived with the freaking Armenians who've been there for two and a half you know, millennia and be like, God, I can't stand these goddamn Armenians? No, absolutely not. Actually, what happened is that they had a perfectly functional system of having all of these cultures live together, which was called the Millet system, in which they essentially governed themselves and didn't cause trouble. And then a bunch of freaking Protestant missionaries came in, mostly in the late 19th century, founding institutions like Robert College in Constantinople and the American University of, Be of Beirut, um, at which an ancestor of mine was the provost. And basically started, you know, at first they came there to teach Christianity, but then they started teaching Western values. And then what they found people really reacted to was this whole doctrine of basically international, you know, Western values. And so what happened is that basically what blew up the Millet system is a bunch of Westerners with the coolest stuff and basically, you know, clearly running the world, coming in and trying to start basically the equivalent of a color revolution, except much more violent among the Armenians. And so actually during World War I, for example, there was a very active proposal in the West to, to basically partition the Ottoman Empire upon victory, such as to construct a state of Armenia in Anatolia on the coast. 
And so essentially the dismemberment of the country in favor of these minorities, uh, you know, was sort of a piece of Western policy. And that Western policy was not just a policy of hard power there. It was also a policy of soft power. So the thing is, basically, when you look at the Ottoman Empire, you... it's like looking at a TV dinner that you put in the microwave. Suddenly it starts like oh, boiling. OK, it's counterpoints. Yeah. Because so, yeah. Yeah. So you turn the microwave you... on. Is your I'm, I'm noticing just a pattern with your critique is like do you just like utterly resent this like class of like world manipulator diplomats who like go out <laughs> in the world and learn like you know three languages and they you know they they drink tea a few times so they think they understand like the entirety of the middle east and north africa and then they just like scheme to have like the well, western I mean, powers uh... no but because in the reason why i'm asking this for, for instance is because like i'm you know, uh, while perhaps not like totally familiar with the Western interventions that preluded the Armenian genocide, I'm just as familiar with like the, the history of like basically, you know, uh, every major caliphate, both Shia and Sunni for like 3000 years. And what you look at when you look at that is a series of people like, you know, the prophet Muhammad comes out. He says sectarianism has nothing to do with me, but he's kind of like Alexander the Great where like he dies and there's no real plan for his rulership. So it's like, well, who does the, you know, the, the Uma go to? And it's like, well, to the strongest. And so the strongest just fight over the body of the Uma for like, I don't know, uh, 1500 years. And the amount of intrigue that you're describing would be like a casual Saturday night in like, you know, uh, post Byzantine Turkey, you know? So, so that's where for me, like I'm looking at this and I see, Pretty much what right now when you're looking at do. it, when you're looking at it, when you're looking at it, counterpoints like where are you looking at it from? Like I see in the background here, I'm going to guess that you're in New Jersey. Maybe you're not in New Jersey. Maybe you're in New Jersey. Maybe you're in Minnesota. But are you looking Florida. at it in Minnesota? Are you looking at it on the TV screen because it's happening in Baghdad? I really, you know, if Baghdad wants to be ruled by Harun al-Rashid, like I say, let Baghdad be ruled by Harun al-Rashid. I grew up in this freaking class, okay? Like my dad was a foreign mm -hmm. service officer. Like we did this for a living, right? You know, and basically- No, but that's what, what I'm I asking. Think... Is it like, are you just annoyed with like all these smarmy, smart ass dickheads who are trying to like manipulate no, the world actually, and don't know 10% of what they're talking about it? individually for the most part they are great people and like i'm sorry to have mm -hmm. to tell this to you but they are great people it is basically the system no, i wish i was a in. part of that class i guess that's the part system, of our problem yeah, you're they're already rubbing people. elbows they're great people but the the system that they're in just sucks and has completely lost its entire sense of purpose and basically has become an entirely self-licking ice cream cone i'll bet there's a lot of great things that those people could do in life i'll bet okay, there so is. hold on, hold on. So let, so let me ask it. this so is this the problem is that you believe that they originally should have uh, like maybe like the American national interest at heart, and that's what they should be engineering. Well, so for. so but so you can't. Instead, they're you, engineering for the global metropolitan you elite. You can't really understand anything until you understand where it came from and how it evolved, and like how this system evolved makes a great deal of sense in my opinion because it evolves in the context of this essentially oligarchic i mean sort of parliament was kind of a real thing 200 years ago in britain but but it's like now it's at like east german levels but the gar the country was actually governed by parliament but but it was still an oligarchy and so you have this oligarchical empire that is sort of the anglo-american empire of the educated elites that kind of spreads, um, you know, across the Atlantic and its center of gravity moves for, you know, arguably just like financial and ac economic reasons, but it's kind of the same tradition of government. And where this method really arises, uh, you know, sort of the, the farthest you can trace it back is the Monroe Doctrine, which is actually a piece of British foreign policy. And this foreign policy is simple, which is that the authority of the European empires over their colonies in the Western Hemisphere shall not be restored because all of these, you know, um, doomed uh, autocratic bad empires got overthrown in the Napoleonic Wars, which itself was the result of leftist radicalism. And so the Holy Alliance, backed by that, you know, the, the tyrant of autocracy, um, who it's funny, if you ask, did I ask you, did I ask Lev, did I ask you the last time the... Um, 
uh, when, uh, you know, when, when Russian troops had been in Paris, right? So Russian troops are in Paris, basically, you know, the czar has, 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 um, it's 1815. And then, um, you know, Lord Canning, uh, I don't know, Canning, George Canning, uh, basically is the, the foreign minister. And he says, you know what, we're not going to restore these colonies to you. We're going to have revolutions there. We're going to have freedom and all this shit, right? And so everybody's going to try to imitate the United States, which they've been doing very unsuccessfully for 200 years. And nominally, this becomes an American foreign policy with the Mon Monroe Doctrine, but it's not really an American policy. It's enforced by the Royal Navy. And what the Royal Navy has done is basically turn these areas with their huge access to natural resources into British commercial colonies. And so you have basically this very, very, very functional, effective form of imperialism where you basically have this kind of political justification for like stealing the colonies of other countries and making them yours while claiming that you're bringing about their independence, right? Wait, and this I, I is will, why they play soccer in Argentina. So the thing is, you know, you see the U.S. Mm -hmm. doing this, for example, in the Spanish-American War. As sure. late as that, to me, that's basically if when Argentinians I look at Argentinians love soccer, why do I give a shit? That, that's my Yeah, point. yeah. So that's sort of, you know, but but I'm, I'm just, I'm not describing mm -hmm. the morals of this well, kind of policy. Well, before, I'm before describing how it works. Before counterpoints. And, and and, and I'm, all I'm saying is that the present policy is like this sort of decayed, non-functional thing that yeah. actually doesn't serve anybody's interests except the sort of the people who do it, you know, version of this thing that used to actually work. So it's like, you know, it used to be a wolf hunting deer and now it's a dog mm -hmm. killing sheep. All right. Before CounterPoint's response, one thing I would add to this quick is that I don't think that Russia would be an equal, at least the Russia of today, would be an equal in comparison to the Spanish Empire or into, uh, to America in terms of uh, their standards, their morality even. You know, so even back then, I would say that the Russia of today, you have New Transnistria, which is part of Moldova, which was taken over by the Russian government. It's a complete shithole. And that's the other thing that people forget in this whole equation. We're not talking about these tea-sipping equals, you know, that are vying for territory. We're talking about people who, yes, they are barbarians in comparison to the uh, people of the Western world. But anyway, counterpoints. Go for it. Well, no, I, I was just going to say, like, yeah, so, like, I, I'm all for... <laughs> God, I'm, I'm such a fucking centrist. I'm sure it makes you puke in your fucking mouth. Um, but what I what what I try to do is there, there's a lot of people. Uh, there's this guy that I debate who would drive you fucking crazy. His name's Bastia. And basically, mm -hmm. like, if there's something that the American neoliberal empire does, it's awesome. Right. Do, doesn't matter. Million dead, half million dead, three million dead. The Civil war, genocide doesn't matter. It's all great. Um, and so and because he, you know, drapes himself in the stated, you know, morality of these neo-colonial, neo-imperial projects. And then, you know, he just by proxy and through practical rhetoric just justifies, uh, you know, neoliberal economics and the global hegemon. Like, 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 so he just does that. But like for me, what I prefer to do because I like to live in reality is I like to look at the horrors of the things that you describe and how people were murdered and genocided and killed for like bat poop and rubber, you know, because that that's literally some of the things that we killed tens of thousands of people for was access to bat poop and rubber because bat poop was like a good commercial product at the time. Um, so, but then I try to take it a step further and be like, well, why were we willing to kill for bat poop and rubber? And when you look at it and it's like, well, the manufacturing of fertilizer and then fertilizer opens up this entire, you know, uh, market of being able to grow more food and growing more food gets more people, more food. And, uh, you know, we, we get all this industrial tech and, you know, all this industrial tech opens up all these cool resources that I use on a day to day basis. So then it becomes like it goes from, uh, you know, Smedley Butler wrote the, the book War is a Racket. And a lot of leftists really enjoy it because it's basically this total indictment of the military industrial complex during the uh, late 19th, early 20th century. And how we're basically like the the uh, the security enforcement arm of like a neo-commercial imperial project. And right. but, but, I, I'm looking at it and I'm just saying like, well, this opened up billions or trillions of dollars. Right. Of economic and so at activity. that, at so that time, 
at that time, the racket actually worked. And so the thing is, basically, what not, you, that what wasn't you, Smedley Butler's opinion or any of the opinions. Of no, the it, on it, the you know, he, Smedley Butler, like, you know, just started going to like the wrong parties with the wrong people in Greenwich Village or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so he, he, he started hanging out this, with a bunch of socialists. He's basically, yeah. he's basically kind of repeating the lib propaganda of his time. So it has a kind of truth to it, but sort of not really. And basically, when you look at U.S. imperialism before 1940, especially kind of before the so-called good neighbor policy, which is another intimation in the early 20th century of late uh, 20th century policy. But when you look at basically classic U.S., like, you know, for example, you know, the U.S. occupation of Haiti, most people don't know that there was, I mean, there have been multiple U.S. occupations of Haiti, but, but the Marines ruled Haiti for about like 15 years in the 20s and 30s and basically left an actually like genuinely well-functioning Haiti. And so you might say that basically the U.S. intervened on the side of United Fruit or whatever the fuck. You might say that the U.S. intervened not only for its own national interests, but also for private int- from the for the private interests of the greedy top-hatted barons involved. Okay, like there's definitely like there's always a little bit of truth in like sort of lib propaganda, but you have to cleanse yourself of even that truth and then kind of accept it back in in the the terms in terms that are actually like sort of not misleading, you know, and so it is true that, for example, the old policy of the U.S. in Mexico, the old imperialist policy was to support uh, the Porfiriato, the rule of Porfirio Diaz and his uh, Cientificos, you know, um, and then essentially when early progressives got into power in Washington, they decided that that regime should not be able to renew itself and thus you should have a civil war. And in that civil war, the sort of the live forces and the commie forces in the U.S. would be paralleled by a proxy war in Mexico between Carranza and Villa. Um, you know, and of course, the candidate of the old regime, Huerta, who had no friends at all, who was the, and that was the last period of real order in Mexico before the Mexican Revolution basically destroyed fucking everything. Moreover, another instance of this policy, which in the 19th century, we already see purely destructive versions of this policy. One of them before uh, you know, I, I was going to say, I, I was Maximilian. Uh, so sorry, go on. Well, OK, so so my question is, I'm trying to figure out what makes the old things good and the new things bad. So, for instance, oh. like, like, like for, for every. Yes, I can explain old, this. Yeah. So, well, just, just to articulate my point for the people at home who might not know where I'm going, um, you know, during the we we colonized the Philippines for a while. And I would say that there was a lot of things that you could point to that were positive where we like instituted democracy and, you know, literacy programs. It's like, blah, you know, blah, 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 money, blah. money, money, Python, life of Brian kind of stuff. You know, uh, what well, have the Romans ever done for us? Remember well, that? I unfortunately I haven't watched Life of Brian, although I do promise that mm. I'm old enough to know a good chunk of Monty Python's work. Uh, but <laughs> but right, the point right. being, that was a Gen X the, dad moment, I guess. But go on. Well, so what I was going to say is that like, but there there are just as many like horror stories during that time period where you know like we were dipping our bullets in pigs' blood, so we would tell the Moros that we were sending them to hell, and you know we basically like you know told all the civilians like, hey. You can come into this area because in 48 to 72 hours, we're going in that area and every single person who's in that area is getting shot. Mm -hmm. Like there's plenty of like moral horrors from that time. um, I don't think anywhere near as many people were killed in all of that stuff as in the right. the so, so yeah so, so well, okay. you know really but, like, but like when you stop be being the... able when you stop being able to fight a guerrilla war then you shouldn't mm-hmm. fight a guerrilla war and that means you shouldn't okay, so, have so quantity quantity would not be like my moral judge because there's very obviously like so many different factors through which like uh you know death can be death and killing can be evaluated and quantity is very rarely a good one so, so what is it? Quantity is that the the primary? Well, I don't know. I mean, how do, you, how do you how do you feel about the firebombing of Dresden? Like, what's your what's your view on that? All right, or uh, even the atomic bombing? Probably of... it was probably unnecessary, but I understand the anger that so made like, it happen. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, you don't want to like. But no, it's about it's the same. How that it's sounds same if you like turn it around like a little bit, like you know, it's what? Like, uh, you know, um, suppose the Nazis had won the war, and then later it turns out, well, you know, it's kind of did away with the Jews, right? You know, and then you're just like, well, you know. Uh, it happened. I was unnecessary. I understand how angry we were at the Jews who were trying to destroy. Us. No, but there's a but you know, okay, like there's there's a, there's a level. Like, like explain that to like the eight year old girl who's like being boiled alive by like you know, uh, um, I, <laughs> you no, know. Let me let me, I mean, let me you know, like let me like, explain. Like, come on, man. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let me. Like, explain. I, I just it doesn't. Uh, it's not so, a good look. Like I. So just there's a moral. Well, is it, well, then I'll I'll explain it. So the moral weight of killing has to do with like necessity, utility, mm. total war versus just war, and then what technology permits you to do as far as like limiting casualties, right? Like like that. That's pretty much where it's at. And when I look at World War II, I see dumb bombs, mass aerial campaigns. I see infantry swarms. I see artillery strikes. I see all that kind of stuff. I see a lot of people not necessarily caring about civilians. And I also see like a moral calculus taken on behalf of the Axis and the Allies simultaneously that pretty much if you're participating in the war effort as a, as a part of like a national movement, you're, you're a fair target. So like we bombed the shit out of plenty of civilians who were supporting the industry of the uh, of the Nazi regime, and we killed those civilians knowingly. But um, you know the reason why Dresden is like a moral exception to that is because there was no real industry to speak of in Dresden that you know you could justify it as a like a legitimate military target, even if you're going to kill civilians. And the argument that I've heard is basically like you have all these rural Germans who have largely been able to pretend that the war doesn't even exist because their life hasn't changed at all in the past five years. And we're sending a fucking message to these people. Fuck you. There's a war going on. Millions of people are dying and you're partially responsible because you're being mm -hmm. uh, complacent with the war effort. Yeah. I should, think that's fucked up. That, I don't think children. A, yeah. Yeah. You should that? put that on. I, yeah. I was about to say, maybe you could put that on a small, smaller bomb for like the eight-year-old girls that would only kind of inflict some burns maybe like maybe first second okay. maybe but, third okay but when it mode. comes okay but hold on so right. I, gotta, I mean i, I just like like morality. like the weirdness the weirdness of the way the 20th century approaches this insane mm -hmm. question and just the insane like so what's your total answer? guilt my answer how, how is do you that, how do you approach how do you approach uh conflict and power and government and who rules and all that uh, i mean uh, you know so when you look at the world order that really preceded this world of 19th and 20th century democratic international law which basically led to these sort of patterns of diplomacy which sort of boiled down to kick the dog until it bites then declare it a mad dog and shoot it um that resulted in so many children boiled alive and so on and so forth you know and we shouldn't forget by the way the sort of evian accords you know policy that you know left left I, the west I, I, you know, you I, know i want to i want to hear your uh, answer you know, but i also so have to so so to sorry it. sorry okay I, i'm not going to launch into thing. i'm not going to yeah. launch wait wait into, just to be know. clear what is counterpoints objecting to okay so just yeah i'll, I'll be brief so you can still make your point so, so for instance, like, you know, during the medieval period when we had, like, you know, these nobles that were leading us and all that kind of stuff, I'm pretty sure that, like, during the War of the Roses and all that kind of shit, they, like, tied family members to each other, shot one of them in the heart with an arrow and threw them into the river so they both drowned. Like, I don't look to, like, medieval warfare as, like, the pinnacle of human morality. Also, I'm pretty sure, like, when we took, like, Jerusalem in, like, 1066 and shit, didn't they literally just put the entire city to the sword? Like, what, what the fuck are we talking about where we're looking, like, back to medieval or noble society and there was, like, a, a more chivalric or higher level of warfare or conflict or sparing civilians? I don't know what I, you're I talking think I, about. You know, I think I'm, I'm mainly... I think sort of the kind of pinnacle of European thought in the multipolar order comes from essentially the 16th through the 18th century. Like, I know this sort of period seems, when you look at it through the fisheye lens of the present, you're like, you know, 16th century, 11th century, some century, it's not now. Like, it all looks like sort of one point. But I, I promise you that, uh, you know, I'm aware of the, uh, the you oh, know. So the tell me what makes it morally different. Of the Albigensians. So so let me, let me go back and basically describe the international order, you know, sort of Westphalian 
multipolar order that existed before the kind of current Anglo-centric unilateral order. And you can see these things kind of morphing into each other in the 19th century with sort of all of this talk of like international arbitration and so forth. There's a whole, you can go down whole pathways of like World War I alternative histories if you have like the new conversion of World War I stuck in your head. Um, but the basic principles of the international order are basically, they're actually really the principles that are reflected in the constitution because the constitution is sort of structured to fit in well with, this was the standard text of international law in the 18th century's Vattel's Law of Nations. And if you're basically asking what the rules should be, I would say that, you know, the most successful orders in human history that have created the most sort of human flourishing have clearly been multipolar orders. And if you're looking for a rule book for a multipolar order, you can't really do better than this kind of clash, classical international law. And, you know, can I just explain explain briefly, like, the principles of this law and kind of how... Yeah, no, I uh, okay. I was literally about so, to ask you why. So so the classic, classical international law is essentially develops from the concept of natural law, you know? And natural law asks the question, suppose we maroon, like, 20 random people on an island, they don't know each other, you know, they haven't made any contract. They haven't agreed to any convention. There is no government over them. How should they behave in such a way that it seems that they are behaving in a way that is essentially lawful and good? And, you know, whatever way that is, you know, the rules that dictate that way are the rules of natural law. So thou shall not kill except maybe in self-defense, is clearly like a natural law and a society in which thou shalt kill, but only on Thursdays, it would be a very strange and unnatural society with me so far. So yeah. basically the natural law of nations says that essentially nations are independent actors stuck with each other on the same planet. And this is sort of the way in which those act, those sovereign actors, which are always conceived in a unitary way. And I, I feel like there's, a, there's a lot objection. of there's a lot of rhetoric. There's a lot of rhetoric that you use. It kind of does this weird, you know, not just you, just sort of conventional rhetoric that sort of does this weird kind of, you know, moat and belly thing with that, where it portrays very non-unitary actors like the American Empire is very unitary because they are like unitary in name, you know, whereas, you know, it's sort of the way like Hamlet will refer to like the king of Denmark as like Denmark, right? You know, and you're, you're actually referring to an institution, maybe in some cases you're referring to a party. But in any case, you know, the law of nations basically treats nations as essentially um, sort of independent sovereigns. And, you know, what it, what it comes to from that is that it basically sort of asserts, it defines a kind of property right between them that says, okay, here are some areas like the ocean that is sort of common property. Here are the rules for the ocean. And then here is what to do when nations have a dispute. And in disputes, which can escalate, of course, to war, the principle of the classical law of nations is that uh, one of the main things that you want, for example, in a war is you don't want wars to spread. You don't want them to sort of metastasize. And so when you have the Seven Years' War, for example, which is a result, you know, which is sort of a very classical kind of war, specifically, you know, when Frederick the Great decides that Maria Theresa, according to this, like, long genealogical paperwork thing that he's prepared is not entitled to Silesia, that he instead should have it. Uh, you know, these are both very capable and effective regimes, uh, you know, and essentially war is the escalation of what is essentially a conflict over property, a tortious conflict into, you know, uh, like essentially the, uh, you know, what, would, if there were a government over nations, be a lawsuit. But since there's no law that basically governs sovereigns, um, war is, as Louis XIV had carved on its canons, the ultima ratio regum, the last argument of kings. 
And so, you know, when you perceive <laughs> war as essentially a kind of law, who had that in the their cannons? Ulti, yes, Ultima Ratio Regal. No, no who, who did that? Louis the Fourteenth. Exceedingly oh, badass motherfucker who ruled, who ruled France for like six years. <laughs> he had right, good legs. Know, right. and, and, and France was the, you know, France was the leading, leading nation of human civilization at that time. That, that's why it was called the Sun King. So, so mm -hmm. the, imagine, you know, the same guy had, you know, uh, I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, and, and so the, the, but laugh out of laugh, laugh, laugh while you can, I, as they said in the Buckaroo Banzai, laugh, laugh while you can, lucky boy. But uh, the, um, you don't recognize that movie. That's a that's no. a real Gen X moment. I'll say nobody uh, knows, well, nobody knows Buckaroo to, Bones Eye anymore. It's really sad. I need to, uh, so, I need to start uh, taking notes. In in any case, in any case, the uh, Peter Weller. Um, in any case, so you have these basically sovereign nations that are peers, and so essentially the principle of yeah, we need to... international law in terms of the way these nations should behave toward each other this is really the important part is that they should essentially behave as naturally friendly actors who nonetheless do not trust each other and so the thing is that basically you know when you see the united states for example like openly fomenting rebels in or spying on as was just you know sort of disclosed in these documents or otherwise sort of you know willfully abusing the sovereignty of these so-called allies you know you basically you know Vittel will tell you Vittel has an exact definition of a protectorate of a basically subordinate state that you know applies today you are a you are a protectorate you are a satellite you were a puppet whatever if you do not have the independent right to make war if you cannot decide whether to make war or not, you were a puppet state, and you're ba and and you were a puppet of whoever holds that power for you, you know. And and so you know when people from the Pentagon will openly go on TV and talk about you know fighting for America's global interests, like to the last Ukrainian, you know, <laughs> which is this level of callousness that just it's like comes right back to like the like you know complicated geostrategic case for like you know baking you know eight-year-old girls in basements right you know and hey, and, you, and and like the the I, the you know like kind of uh, and, and, and i'm just like you know why can we not take this whole thing and just step back from it and just basically look at just like how rancid and stale and horrible and permanent it is and then when we look okay is the 18th century system perfect no it's not Maybe it's not perfect. Maybe it needs to be improved in one in one way or another. Maybe there are ways in which um, it has trouble with, for example, the kind of glo much more global nature of military technology today. Mm -hmm. There are various interesting things to do with it. When, but when you, well, I, I got to make sure counterpoints so gets uh, gets into this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so, so critique my critique my Vitel. Yeah. Um, so what you're okay. So I'm. One of the first things that you were saying when you when you uh, first started articulating the view, uh, where I immediately saw like the conflict with uh, global hegemonic liberalism or whatever. Which, which let let's face it, you can view this as a veneer. Like I, I view it as both simultaneously. You can view this as the veneer and the moral justification through which uh, war profiteers use human rights as an excuse in which to like, uh, interfere dude, dude, in the dude. affairs of their neighbors. It would be so uh, much better if it was war profiteers, because it would mean someone was turning a profit. At least some <laughs> motherfucker would be turning a profit. Now <laughs> I'm dead serious. Now it is just, nations. if, 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 if the profit is being turned, something in some way is going right. That is much more than you can say for the U S occupation of Afghanistan. And, well, okay, and like, well, hold up. Are we are we ignoring like Halliburton and KBR and all those like defense contractors who are making yeah, like five hundred dollars for a laundry the, bag? That's not where the policy is coming from. No one at state is like secretly working at Halliburton. Halliburton will definitely do all the work and it will, you know, um, you know, charge you a cost plus contract or whatever. But where these decisions are coming from is freaking kids who, you know, are were gone into the Obama administration because they watched the West Wing every day when they were 14. <laughs> you know, this is like drama kid occupied America. Oh, I'm totally God, not kidding. Is, you know, and, and this, is, this is where the, this no, is where the people this is, wrong. This is no, where the people of fucking state come from. And, no. you know, the idea that basically, you know, policy is set no. in the Pentagon instead 
instead of in state. The Pentagon has been like states bitch since, you know, well, I mean, you know, state Please, in the do 40s. Do not take this from me. OK, do not take this from me. Please let me go to my deathbed believing <laughs> that it's Donald Rumsfeld <laughs> and Dick Cheney twirling their non-existent mustaches to work for defense contractors uh -huh, uh -huh. and then yeah, to see, get into the DOD and the Department of State this and then to stuff push is things. So, like, it's too... It's, no, it's no, like, no, no, because, it's no. It's not because... pessimistic enough. Okay, That's counterpoints. Prove them wrong. You know, there's Proof actually, wrong. like, there's so much no, hope I don't, in the Chomsky view think... of the American empire. You have to give no, up that hope. No, this is worse. You don't need that hope. It's worse. a burden. It's a burden. Hold you can Zep. set that uh, burden down no, and just give up hope and be happy. No, you have to understand how much more of a suffering thing this is. Where, like, basically, because you you have no idea that this is a this is older millennial Gen X uh, like mm -hmm. like cross cultural pain right now. Because while I didn't watch The West Wing myself, I've seen enough like cringe like West Wing speech like uh, compilations or whatever, mm -hmm. where it's just some of the worst shit I've ever heard in my entire life. So for instance, like uh, the post 9-11 one, they basically do like the speech for like a 17 year old White House staffer talks about how the Arabs hate us for our freedom and shit. And I, I'm trying to think of like another one where um, uh, they're, they're talking about, oh, uh, the, the president, of course, even though was he a Republican? I I'd love to see, you know, Martin um, Bartlett. He, no, I don't think he was a Republican. I, I'd love to see like I hope he was a, a West Democrat. Wing episode where like Martin Bartlett decides, I think that was the name, decides he's going to fix Haiti. And, you know, oh, perhaps I would love half it of it can... from the point of view I want to see of, the like, drone the striking and then the other half, of the West The other wing. half will be from the current point of view of the current oh. de facto leader of okay. Haiti. All right, or, back or, to or, back to Russia. I was about Ukraine, to say, but... you, you, actually, you actually upset me because, like, I, I, need, I need to not necessarily push against it. I'll take what you've said into consideration, but it makes my world so much worse. Um, yeah. So, uh, basically... When it comes Just to don't let these, yourself go back me, on the hope. Just, you know. Okay. All right. Yeah. Which, which is funny Hope's because variety. literally, like, there's something that's weirdly hopeful about about a bunch of, like, State Department ideologues trying to, like, engineer the world for, like, you know, the ultimate, like, liberal, uh, you know, the Afghan gays and women can read bullshit. So it's worth, like, a few hundred thousand lives. There's something, like, weirdly naive and hopeful about that that almost makes me hope that, like, there are people who believe in humanity that much that they're willing to burn the planet to the fucking ground. But, I don't know, man. Like, That's a weird kind of like, hope. At the you same know, time, like, hope is I, like porn. You know, everybody's into something, you know? It, uh... I guess. I guess. And, but then that that's my <laughs> thing is like there has to be some kind of like roof pragmatism where like uh, a State Department staffer goes to like a reading program in like the middle of like Afghanistan and he sees like girls with like melted faces from fucking acid and shit and he goes, Oh, turns out me pushing my culture onto other people, despite me still thinking it, it's good, has dire consequences for other yeah, human you know, beings you know what, that I best, didn't the, calculate. The best way, the best way. I, 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 I do need to. I I, I will a, listen to that, you, but I do have to give you the liberal calculation against your Westphalian nationalist uh, calculation. Uh, okay, I'm, uh, I'm I was just gonna say. I was just gonna say the the best. You can you can go on with that. I just wanted to say the best way to sort of administer that lecture i mean this is very similar to like a kind of denazification you know problem uh you know no actually what your staffer should find is that one day he wakes up and um you know his um his credentials don't work when he logs in and he goes to the building and the building is locked and there's police tape around it and um you know, uh, then he goes back and tries to log in again and it, he gets one of these domain has been seized warnings, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're when your illegal steroid such site has been shut down or something. And, um, you know, then he goes to check out the building again and there's just like a big hole in the ground. Uh, and later he gets a, That's what you you know, want from the department. later he gets a check in the mail that is basically his accumulated retirement pension, big check courtesy of the Federal Reserve, which can print dollars. And then in the mail also. Here's where we get to the girls with the burned faces. He gets a DVD and he has to watch the DVD and write an essay about it. And uh, if he can do so successfully, uh, uh -huh. and this will also put his name on a list, by the way, if he can do so successfully, his retirement will be bumped by 25%. Uh, so, you know, uh, he basically, after that whole experience, then he can kind of chill out for a while, spend his retirement and then kind of, embark on the rest so, of his life which he should do because he's obviously a very talented guy because he passed the foreign service exam or whatever 
Okay, so people. what what I what That's I hear view. is right. dissolve the State Department, let oh. the world do what it's going to do for its uh you know this previous Westphalian national. Sure, that's right. Uh, that's right. Model. You know, and the, and then force it. the force the people who contributed to the miseries of the world to contend with the consequences of what they actually caused. Sure. So so you basically say you know let's let's talk about the relationship between the U.S. and France. Now, some would say that's a. I want to talk about the motivating factors in a second, but I'm listening. Yeah, As yeah, fact, before, so... before we do this, can you can you take a note and then I I can articulate. Okay, the I'll take a note and then I'll I'll. I, I'll I don't know into detail if... about my proposal. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> yeah, then we'll get into your proposal. So the um so when it comes to the liberal view, uh, you've asked me a series of questions of whether or not I'm a, I'm familiar with X Y Z A B C. Are you familiar with like Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Of course. Okay, so uh, my perspective is that this is like rooted subconsciously in humanity and rather than being just like some self-explanatory uh, thing about like human psychology, it actually is the way like liberals think about mm -hmm. human life where you enable human beings to succeed. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar, there's like five tiers. It talks about like what you pursue psychologically, almost in sequence, although not necessarily in sequence, but it's how you prioritize your life on a day-to-day -day basis. It starts with like uh, physi uh, physiology, security, social ego, uh, self-actualization. And it's a pyramid, even though some people, you know, discuss whether or not that's a, a reasonable way to structure the, the thing, whatever, who gives a shit. Point being that like human beings um attempt to climb this hierarchical need structure on a day-to-day -day basis where they try to fulfill their physiological needs if they can fulfill their physiological needs and they try to uh, they try to make sure their security needs are fulfilled if their security needs are fulfilled then they'll uh, prioritize their social needs and if their social needs are uh, fulfilled they'll prioritize their egotistical needs like uh, pursuing high ambition and work and all that kind of stuff and then finally self-actualization which is basically becoming the best version of a human being you can you can become so liberals, uh, you know, the liberal hegemon, capital L liberals, believe that every human being who was born on this planet is entitled to that journey. And so there's these like hard scrabble, horrific places like Afghanistan and Iraq, where dictators are denying the human beings under their societies the ability to self-actualize, and they're keeping them at the uh, physiological and security tier and maybe a little bit of the social tier, and they keep everything so... Um, uneven and dictatorial and hard scrabble and all that kind of stuff that human beings are basically not living the ideal lives that human beings are designed to live. So can I, can I translate, can I translate that into my language? Like, uh, can I finish and then you can please. translate? Um, so, so basically it is the job of the liberal hegemonic order to reach into these dictatorial, desperate, despotic regimes bring them into the global economic fold so they have accesses you know access to gay porn and fucking playstations and xbox and then by by having access to the free global market and liberalism and all that kind of bullshit everybody can become their best gay trans straight and this is so awesome that if we muslim kill tons, and and this is so awesome that you know if we go it's worth a few hundred thousand problem. lives Every day. Well, that's just one country, dude. I mean, yeah. have you heard of the decolonialization of Africa, right? I mean, you know, the the man, like, you know, like, like, yeah. So, so, okay, you know, we're we're, but we're do you, first but do you of all, think that's like an accurate all, assessment of the way yeah, that they, yeah. so, their so mind first, works? First of all, first of all, then yeah, it's an accurate assessment in this sort of interestingly twisted way. Um, you know, like, okay, yeah, I think honestly, I think the death toll from this pattern of thinking is actually solidly in nine figures, but like the, you know, leaving that aside, um, the, like the pattern of thinking itself is very interesting because as you were running through the parody, the, you know, the, the, the pyramid of needs and going through each step, you know, as you know, the actual ancient Egyptian pyramids today, they, they were clad in limestone. So that you, when you imagine the Great Pyramid, imagine it in like shining white limestone. The Old Kingdom is just awesome. And, and then at the top, the very top of the pyramid, which is, of course, has been stolen long ago, what's called what's called a pyramidion, like a golden pyramid that shone, that just like from which the sun was. I mean, it was just been an amazing sight to see these things. And I was thinking, you know, you have this pyramid of needs, right? And what is what is the the pyramid on? What is at the top, you know, of this pyramid of needs? And I think that you know the answer is very very clear. 
cocaine. And so, you know, <laughs> when, when you basically... <laughs> When, I mean, when, when, when for a certain yeah. class of people, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and so, so, so sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be laughing at my own joke here. But you know, I think it's pretty fun. But you know, in any case, you know, the thing is that, like, I don't think you know if you basically put cocaine in the water supply of mm. the Ukraine, and they're all like Slava cocaine. -y, Right. Sorry, that wasn't my idea. But, you know, they're all like basically, yeah, of course, like, uh, you know, could you get, you know, Ukrainian nationalism works can motivate the people, uh, you know, Japanese nationalism worked can motivate the people, whatever. It's actually it's really it's really astounding. Actually, it shows, you know, when I look at sort of the kind of ruthlessness of, of power addicts, because what we're really talking about here, the euphemism for self-actualization that's being employed here, which is typical of kind of a sort of nobility's way of thinking, is, um, you know, what they really, the only way to self-actualize themselves is either the feeling or the reality of political power. Or at least it's a kind of status that comes with only holding power. And you just, if you need that status, it's like you do coke every day and you just can't imagine your life without coke. It's very boring, very dreary. Very Putin bad. used to deal you know, coke, by the way, in the same, uh, Vladimir Putin in St. Petersburg awesome. Harbor. He used to awesome. uh, transport in there. Well, all that aid money was supposed to Incredibly go to the Russian based. people. And Incredibly he ended up based. having, wanna... yeah, anyway. So, so in any case, in any case, yeah. let, you know, let's get, let's, let's, let's get off the, let's get off, get off the coke. And so, and so. I want to go know, back to the coke real quick before we move off of it. So, so. so the, the, counterpoints. Well, counterpoints. I want to make yes. your analogy even more beautiful. So Please. the reason why I love the Pyramidion to be cocaine is because I'm imagining like this higher class of person who's just like, you know, sitting in like a DC bar or something like that, imagining how they're gonna change the world. And so not only do they have like the hubris of trying to enable like all human beings in order to su succeed up the, you know, the fucking pyramidion, but while other people are like being arrested for like doing coke, they're fucking doing cocaine like in the bathroom while they're imagining these great power struggles that will set the world sure. correct and they'll be the architect of, uh, you know, this new world. And sure. So, uh, I mean, just, I just because Hitler didn't have a plan for taking over the world in 1940 doesn't mean FDR didn't, you know, <laughs> and doesn't mean that Putin doesn't either. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but you have to keep I in does. mind his it's... you have to keep in mind his situation when you have somebody who ends up getting more support from his people when he invades countries as opposed to when he does not. That kind of keeps you going in that mode, whether you want to or not. And that's going to be an issue going forward. Let me ask you a question about Putin. Putin's oh. motivation. Sure. Um, you know, imagine Putin making, you know, um, my question is basically, you know, we know how, for example, misinformed Putin is. We know, you know, all these kinds of bad things about the structure of decision making in Russia. I'd love to see Prigozhin in the role, frankly. But the, um, uh, you know, we're, the, we, you know, you go to the war with the Putin you have. What do you think <laughs> Putin expected the result to be when he started this war? Did you expect, did you think he expected the result to be this, you know, horrendous grind that he's entered into? No, I think yeah, he you thought know, that Ukraine would fold. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so the thing is, basically, when you're looking, when you're modeling someone, uh, you know, when you're modeling Putin as someone who chose the thing that has happened, who opened the door that had a tiger behind it saying, like, I want a tiger. Right. You know, he wasn't looking for a tiger. He was looking for a sack of gold. Right. And so if you model him as the Ghana guy who doesn't care if there's a tiger behind the door, you're modeling him wrong. And when mm. you model him wrong and you basically make calculation errors and a large number of people die because of your calculation errors, you should basically take an NTSB style approach to it and treat it like an airplane crash and be like, basically, the approach of the U.S. to a disaster like the Ukraine war should be like an inquest like the one we should have into the COVID lab leak, where you're basically like, you know, treating Peter Daszak and Victoria Newland. Uh, pretty much the same, despite the fact that Newland caused, you know. And while we're doing that, Putin's going to act. acquire more territory because Ukraine's not being supplied with weapons. Oh, my God. You know, he'll find a path. He'll take Odessa, you know. Right. I mean, you know, the, let me let me let me go back and, and describe, you know, the right 
relationship. I, I was about to say, like, we, we can okay. describe this as very arbitrary, but, the, you know, that is not arbitrary. Like, like, whether you think it's been astroturfed or not, that's not like an arbitrary outcome to the people who are still fighting the war who still believe in it. Well, you know, I think if they want to leave Odessa, they'll have plenty of opportunities to do so. You know, I graduated in high school when Odessa was part of the Soviet Union. Many of my ancestors, I believe, were Odessan Jews. You know, uh, Odessa has changed hands a number of times uh, since then. Uh, you know, it really, like, my feeling of basically kind of losing my power as an American citizen that is expressed by the fact that I elect a president who is in theory in charge of the Foreign Service, the power that gives me uh, over Odessa, I'm like happy to let that power slip from my hand. You know, my view is that whoever the is Jewish Odessa, <laughs> you know, like my, my, Listen, my, I'm the hands on Delta, okay, King? I'm just my here perspective for the long run. is that Odessa should be owned by whatever, you know, best armed goy is in the region of Odessa, except if the Israelis want it when, you know, uh, I mean, right. be then they are the rightful, you know, and, and uh -huh. they could go north. They could go hard. Right. You know, if the Israelis want to go up against Russia, uh, I'm just like, the, uh, you know, the, the Jews inside uh, of the yeah. Azov battalion camera. would not let's take kindly. Let's, yeah, let's get on camera. Those. That's right. You know, and, and, you know, I was about to mention the like utter disgustingness of using the Azov battalion. Not that I like freak out about, oh, my God, neo-Nazis. But like the funniest thing about that is sort of the willingness and about sort of sort of kind of liberal nationalism in general is about mm -hmm. the willingness of these like ruthless purblind bureaucrats to simply use any force, no matter how ostensibly inimical to their values to basically produce the result that they they want to need. It reminds me of this famous case that I always cite in the Rand Revolt in South Africa in 1922, which is a communist, literal communist run labor strike uh, among workers in the gold mines. And they're carrying signs saying, workers of the world unite to keep uh -huh. South Africa white. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that's sort of the, uh, that, that's kind of what Victoria Newland is doing by sponsoring the Azov, Azov you know, battalion. Of course, okay, if you on, ask the, you know, Azov, oh. if you ask Azov why they're doing this, you know, to like re let the country be run by like gay George Soros, they're basically like, oh, George Soros isn't using us, we're using him. You know, right. and I'm like, the country you know, which uh, this, I may like, add, like, I may add real this? quick, the country sure. where the far right and this was even before this war got elected to maybe like point uh, something percent of parliament. You know, what, what yeah, an incredibly far matter. right country you know, it that matters. is. It turns out that it matters a lot less if you have like death squads. And, uh, you know, the death squads who whose was, heads who did know, profess Lev, the Lev, Nazi Lev, opinion Lev, were fired. What's, your, what's your opinion about the snipers on the Maidan? Do you believe it was all the Burkuts? Uh, OK, I don't. Th th this is uh, sorry. We're, we're, yeah. we're, we're yeah. zooming in too close for us to okay, 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 have okay, a relevant okay, okay. conversation. So hold on, hold on, hold on. But, but I want to I want to extrapolate this because we're, we're using the examples. But I want to talk about like the, the morality that we're actually talking about. So the, the way because we are talking about competing moral systems, you're saying, why have the blood on your hands at all when you can defer to this um, you know, previous level of nationalism that keeps the moral lines pretty clear? And you let the sins of my country be my country's sins and you let the sins of your country be your country's sins. And if there's intrigues and deaths and dismemberments and whatever, if the if the Taliban rule Afghanistan, that's no skin off my ass because the Afghans are kind of choosing that by allowing them to rule. Um, so like, no, like they, I understand. You know, there's a little bit of consent theory creeping in there, but sure. Go on. Well, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what else you would motivate. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, maybe you just, I, I don't even know if you care about what I mean, I suppose that, like, you know, the Chinese right. actually have a land border with Afghanistan. You might not have known that. Suppose they want to turn mm -hmm. it into Chinese Afghanistan. I was just, I'm, I'm like, Hey man, you know, cool. Right. You, you dealt with the Uyghurs, you know, now try the Pashtuns. You know, uh, like I don't know, like, like yeah, so make sure you get it on TV. Joking. Like you're you're kind of joking, but then that literally that kind of gets into the moral the moral quandary of liberals, where they're like, hey, each human being has you know the the right, whether or not you actually believe they have the right, right? Because we could start mm -hmm. talking about rights. Um, but every human being has the right to, uh, you know, development, self-actualization. They should have the right to education and autonomy and freedom of conscience and freedom of speech and all that kind of stuff. We're projecting all these uh, Western values onto the rest of the world. But if you are like a, a capital L liberal who does believe in some of these concepts, I think it's within 
a certain logical purview that you would assume that this way of governing would be good and that as much of the world as possible uh, should be like that. Well, so why, I, so why I think, wouldn't liberals I think, you know, whether you're a liberal or a conservative or whoever, uh, uh, ideas have consequences. And uh, as the Bible tells us, the tree should be judged by its fruits. And if okay. the and fruits of South your ideas, one of the fruits. if the fruits, again, of uh -huh. your ideas are chaos and war and death, then, you know, like, maybe you should think about that. You know, what you see when you okay, look you at should, the wars, you when you look at when you look at the wars of uh, the European wars of the 17th and 18th century, you see that these are wars that do not recall the behavior of primitive savages who, you know, uh, murder civilians upon victory. These wars are what's called cabinet wars. They death and destruction is generally limited to the combatants. Uh, cities are not, uh, you know, um, there's no like, you know, mass murder is a thing, especially mass murder of like civilians is a thing you see very, very sporadically and in small quantities in Europe, basically since the Christianization of Europe. OK, the Vikings certainly pull some shit. Right. You know, the Romans, you know, Julius Caesar, you know, has no respect for human rights, you know, but the rules of war are like generally followed. And so you're basically taking a world that invented the rules of war and you're saying, well, OK, your rules of war, whatever. But now the rules of war and the law of nations has to give way to the law of liberalism. And the law of liberalism mm -hmm. seems to be, number one, the world is governed as an empire through soft power from London or Washington. And number two, anyone who resists this empire will be crushed, um, you know, either by sanctions or perhaps by fire and the sword. And, you know, to me, that just doesn't seem very different from the choice offered by many empires throughout history. And then we ask, does this empire govern its nations well? And you're like, you know, let's take the case of, okay, suppose Putin does go to Paris. Suppose he goes all the way there. Suppose he goes to the channel. I would like him to stop at the channel. I, you know, if I was setting policy okay, and, and, he got his, and he got his tanks to the channel, I would be like Premier Putin so far, but no farther. You know, but, you know, I, let's imagine. Let's conceive. Have you been to on the Paris metro? What about the Moscow metro? How are these two, two things different? Right. Do you think it's possible? Russia's got more actually, Muslims. <clears throat> do you think it's possible that actually... Premier Putin or maybe even Xi Jinping, because we must imagine a partnership there. Do you think they'd be capable of cleaning Paris up? <laughs> Do you know, there's something called Paris syndrome among Chinese oh tourists God. where they go to Paris. And they're like, holy cow. You know, I feel like my my reservation got screwed up and I ended up in Manila, you know, and Cur like, Curtis, oh, real Paris fast. I know I know counterpoints, Manila, counterpoints. But, you yeah. want to respond. You want to respond. Yes. Counterpoints. Go, so, go for it. Yeah. So if we if we were going to do this thing, so you're saying like, oh, well, you know, the results of the liberal hegemonic order is chaos and death and destruction. Um, but that's pretty much like, yeah, I can see the chaos and the death and destruction. I think you'd be a fool to deny it. Um, but I also see, like, if you look at if you look at the stats, which maybe this is all like liber liberal fucking psyops or whatever. But if you look at the fucking stats, um, and if you look at like, you know, life expectancy, death from war, death from disease, access to this, that, the other, you know, global poverty rising up, the amount of wars that even occur in the I, first I, place I, per capita, uh, fucking deaths as a result of these things. All these things have been trending down the entirety of the 20th century, which is basically like correlated with the rise of the liberal hegemonic order. So how do you well, just you like, know, you I'm, just I'm, say, I'm well, glad well, there was a few yeah. hundred thousand people dead in Iraq, therefore at least, the at least you achieved destruction at least, is morally bankrupt. At least you achieved your global empire and at least the wars, you know, to conquer this empire are over. I think the empire provides pretty shitty government. You know, it's notable, for example, that the, word third, that the word third world used to convey optimism. It was actually an optimistic term. If you go to SF State, uh, they still have, maybe they've changed the name, the third world center, which is not meant to be a grim joke 
on the state of, you know, San Francisco. And so if you look at all of Africa, all of South America, all of these liberalizing policies have been result have resulted in sort of enormous retreats. Then if you go, for example, and go to the New York, every New York Times, it's a, you know, it's a, a, a website, nytimes.com. They recently had uh, an article on El Salvador. You've probably heard of El Salvador and it's yeah, new where uh, they arrested President Duke Kelly. Yeah, the right. And, and the New York Times yeah. is just like, it's just like, well, the president has 90% support and the country is a totally different and much better place. But, you know, what would this do for democracy? You know, and, and I'm just like, you know, but, like, oh, I got I, I got to respond time, to this unless counterpoints and, response first. No, I, I absolutely want to respond to it. But I'm I'm waiting for him to arrive at the point, because if you're looking here, here's the thing. Like I we're we're moving we're moving between like two conceptions of liberal. OK, so when I when I'm thinking of the liberal hegemonic order, I'm thinking of like liberal with a capital L. I'm thinking of like 18th century, 19th century, like free market philosophers trying to figure out what the world is going to look like with either without kings or with kings in a significantly reduced role. That, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about people who are trying to like take as much governmental power as possible, either through republicanism or indirect democracy and all that kind of shit. And they're trying to like create the ultimate utilitarian society that maximizes freedom and material well-being for all, all kinds of people. What you're kind of I'm not saying like intentionally sneaking in there but what I'm kind of hearing is a different kind of liberal which is I think of like pussy ass fucking progressives who don't have a spine who can't like they they see like somebody covered in like you know uh, MS13 tattoos fucking like raping and murdering people in the street and they're like well, what was his childhood like? Maybe we should get him into a rehab program. Or they see somebody like shitting on the street and they're like, wow, this is such a beautiful and vibrant city. Like, I don't fucking, you know, I, I don't associate like or want to back those people philosophically at all. I think they're fucking cretins. I think that the way that like I would compare power uh, of like the liberal hegemonic order and the militarization and all that kind of stuff. The way that I would compare power to you, where I say, like, look at all these autocratic societies that are fucked up for X, Y, Z, A, B, C reason, is the same way that I would, uh, 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 like, uh, talk to them. And I would say, you're not exercising enough power because you're so scared of blood and shit and getting your hands dirty that you'll basically allow the entirety of society to collapse before you even get uncomfortable at all. So for me, it's it's about, like the even and proper distribution of power and its exercise rather than saying that there's a binary choice between like progressive mm. liberal degradation and uh, fucking authoritarian fucking dictatorship which by the way if i could if i could snap my fucking fingers and become like, like turn the united states into like a singaporean fucking civic nationalist pseudo weird authoritarian but also libertarian state i would do that but I don't think that there's a lot of appetite in the American people for that. Wait, before Curtis uh, responds, counterpoints. I can't help but think mm -hmm. that your microphone is not the one that you think it is. Just tap on it. I want to make sure it's the right one. I could be completely... Is my, is my volume low? Yeah, it's not working. So it was a different mic that was being used this whole time. It was still good. That's why I didn't say anything. But please switch to your perfect mic and then that'll be even better. Right. I'll shoot people in the face, but the, the or I'm shooting people in the face, so I might need a second to swap. But basically, uh, I'm, I, I used a program called NVIDIA, NVIDIA Broadcast, and I did add a setting to it, so that could be it. But mm. I'll double check that it's not this mic uh, momentarily. No problem. And also, before Curtis responds, I just want to say that one place where I see this nice balance happening could be in a future Ukraine and Poland and other alliances that are going to occur in the Baltics and Eastern Europe. Because a lot of these places, you could say that they were vaccinated by communism, by the USSR. So unlike like the pussies on the West, they actually have a bit of experience what happens when things go woke, which is why I'm actually holding out on those countries being a better example of where things could go. But anyway, Curtis, uh, your response. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, you're sort of kind of dividing this natural phenomenon in half and you're saying i want the good half and not the bad half and you know the the things that you're associating with the good half are not particularly in my view things from the good half they're simply the absence of bad and so when we look for example at the mindset behind the french revolution we clearly find that the french revolution is caused by liberals and then 
continued by radical Jacobins. And we find the same events, we find the same effect, of course, in the Russian Revolution. And so we kind of can't help but, you know, evaluate the actions of the liberals by because their results rather than their intent. Okay, because but how do you when look we, at wait, 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 because because clearly when we look when we compare the regimes of Louis the Sixteenth and the regimes of Robespierre, we find that the regime of Louis the Sixteenth was far more liberal in the way that you like. Furthermore, one of the things that you're doing is you're basically crediting all of these things that are obviously simply the results of peace and good order to liberalism with a capital L. You're simply describing the absence of, of Bolshevism there. In fact, science and good order has done, you know, did very well. Science and literature and good order did very well under the authoritarian regime of Elizabeth I. It did perfectly fine among the Tudors and the Stuarts. The Royal Society is founded, you know, under the Restoration. Furthermore, you know, even extreme authoritarianism is not at all inconsistent with science. One of the things in engineering, especially, uh, one of the things that I like to mention about the strange thing that we have in Washington is even though that it's sort of, there are many agencies of foreign governments that are sort of really, in a sense, uh, you know, agencies of the U.S. government, there's also an agency of the U.S. government that is actually a little transplanted piece of the Third Reich, by, of course, which I mean NASA. And Operation so we actually Paperclip. we took this. Yeah. We took the yeah, we took the we literally just took the Nazi space program and used it to put an American on the moon. Right. And 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 that Nazis, I mean, of course, there are no Nazis at not NASA today. You know, I'm not saying it's a, you know. Uh, not a coincidence that Nazi and NASA sound so similar, but like, there you go. Right. Mm. But you know, the, the, like in any case, like when you, uh, you know, one of the things I like to quote on the subject is uh, if you know a book called uh, a writer called Stefan Zweig, he was an Austrian Jewish writer mm. under the Austro Hungarian empire. Um, you know, in some ways, the Wes Anderson film Grand Budapest Hotel is like inspired by Zweig. Nice. And Zweig, when he's basically describing the sort of paradise of like order and progress that he existed in before the war, is describing the completely authoritarian Austro Hungarian Empire. And so when you basically credit but liberalism. Come on, man. Like, like, you can't bring up an example like that where I'm familiar with the shit because basically what we're talking about while we're talking about like the 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 order of authoritarian austro-hungarian empire or whatever that was the same society that created hitler because the austrians were being fucking persecuted and they were being told that hitler they couldn't speak austrian hitler. <laughs> um uh, austrian is german um uh -huh. and hitler was a product you know of austria of course uh after or, or excuse me uh war. no 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 okay uh, yeah, yeah yeah the germans were or excuse me the austrians were fucking prohibiting germans from like having civic seats and also speaking german and all that kind of shit and that bigotry was what uh fucking hitler basically no, the put Czechs, as one the of his Czechs, major the fucking Czechs. The Czechs were were discriminating against Germans in the in the Sudetenland, but of course, German was always kind of the national civic language of Austria. But when I when I look at Vienna before Vienna in 1905 to describe this as a sort of doomed society that doesn't have science or art or anything, this is one of the uh, I'm, I'm not gonna, capitals of the world. I'm not going to be and like it doesn't have any of your people. precious democracy. It doesn't have any street crime. It doesn't have any homeless on the street right you know how can how, you know how can you basically anyone from any you know place in because the present world sins. look at vienna in 1905 and say oh because we've invented antibiotics and you hadn't invented antibiotics yet even though we have like freaking screaming insane homeless beggars in our streets you know okay. um no, okay hold but, on, and hold our on. catalytic converters we're, keep getting stolen wait, okay right? you know, counterpoint we're, we're counterpoint to this we're, okay so what what we're doing is we're comparing sins and virtues and that's what that that's what we're really doing here you have certain virtues that you hold up in society i would say that are different than mine that you view as more important 
I have certain virtues that I believe are more important, uh, or at least I've been raised to believe that they are more important. And I maybe I agree. So, for instance, if there if there's like a, a body, if we're supposed to, if we take like uh, fascists at, at their word to, um, you know, basically conceptualize the body as a corporate structure. So something that is capable of working in harmony with multiple different pieces and components, but ultimately sharing the same goal and hopefully some level of homeostasis. Like I the, will like agree. the famous frontispiece piece to Leviathan, if you've seen that. Well, I, I have not. So I, I, I need to write down like four movies at the end of this conversation. But um, so I will agree and concede instantaneously to homeostasis being out of whack in the Western world. So if we were looking at it as a corporate body, I believe right. that we are infected with a, a virus or a bacteria or a disease. The woke mind virus. Of, that is that is out of that is out of whack. Well, I think the reason why we are infected with the woke mind virus is because we have a uh, upper class, a brain that is actively choosing to feed its body exclusively fast food and junk and doesn't feed it vegetables and fruit and all that kind of stuff and look at the rest of the body as a part of itself so if if i was to take this rawly out of um rawly out of the analogy phase and into uh like like our real phase i feel like the ruling class of the united states of america views the rest of the country as cattle they are cattle to be force-fed and to be entertained and to be slovenly you know taken care of in the worst way possible so they can work 40 to 60 hours a week so profit can be extracted from them so then in turn they can raise a new generation of serfs to work in the fucking industrial perpetual motion machine that's how i think our upper class views just a little little so, too much chomsky in that but i basically agree okay so then i think what's happened though is that because we haven't taken care of our body excuse me because we haven't taken care of our body we have become immunocompromised, and now we are being corrupted by what I would view as like leftist infiltration. I would view it as a bacterial infection or a viro- virological infection or whatever. But That's what very, we're doing, let, let me ex- can I explain? What we're doing, what we're doing mm-hmm. is we are fighting a culture war in which we're trying to use, you know, penicillin or antibiotics or antivirals or whatever in order to kill the woke mind virus. But my critique of the upper class is that if you don't feed your body vitamins and nutrients and vegetables and all that kind of shit, the virus is going to come back. So it doesn't matter if you win the culture war, if you're setting up the conditions that are ultimately going to destroy the body in the first place. So, and sorry, let me just wrap this up and put a bow on it. If you talk to me about that, I am totally fine with that. But what I am saying to you is that the brain being separate and thinking of itself as separate from the rest of the body is part of our problem. So giving more power to the brain is not my solution. And, and so, sorry, I'm still listening, but I got to let a dog out and turn on a fan. I'm getting hot as fuck in this room. Holy shit. And while I have the floor, everybody, knock yeah, the hell on. out of that subscribe button, like button. Be sure to click the bell. That's very important. And also, I know this is a self shameless self-promotion here, but Curtis, I have also started a Substack. It's called Lev's Lens, my lens on all the happenings in the world. And I'm going to be doing a little write-up of this conversation after the fact as well. So everybody go to levpo.substack.com. Subscribe to my Substack too. So anyway, Curtis, uh, your response to counterpoints. <sighs> well, you know, I like your I like your metaphor because I find it illustrative in a way of this kind of um, 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 hopium that I feel like you're smoking. And well, I'm competing thing with is, liberal West Wing dorks. So, I mean, apparently yeah, I'm not Yeah, that's even right. The most that's naive. right. That's right. That's right. And so the thing is, basically, you're just like, you know, here I am next to an intellectual, like, meth addict who thinks that's, you know, this disease is actually good, that it's not a disease that, you know, meth makes him thinner, kind of thins out his crowded teeth, gives you him know, energy. Some, gives him energy, right? And so next to a meth addict, you're sitting there, you're puffing your hopium, you're not like breaking into cars and shit, life is pretty good, right? But the thing is, you're still smoking, okay? And, and so, you know, my, I guess I would think about it this way, is that 
you know, when you describe the body politic as being sick with a virus or a bacterium, those are different things. And, and, you know, but, but they have something in common, which is that you're, you're thinking of the force of the disease as something and essentially alien that can be expelled. It's sort of like the way McCarthy thought about communism in the 1950s. He's like, we just have to find, we, are, we, did, we just discovered penicillin, cures syphilis, which like you wouldn't believe the nation has intellectual syphilis, got to get the commies out of there. And, and, you know, but like, you know, of course, when you discover that your body is slowly declining in some way, especially when you see that the decline is kind of slow and inexorable, uh, you should, you know, sort of be convinced, you should bring yourself to consider a couple of less hopeful ways of perceiving the problem. Uh, for example, you might not be a bacterium or a virus at all. You might have old age or even worse, it might be cancer. Or, you know, and so the thing is, basically, what I see is a bunch of people out there kind of treating cancer with penicillin or pretending to treat cancer with penicillin. And I feel that that's very like, you know, normally, yes, penicillin is good against bacteria. It's not good against viruses. Uh, you're not you're sort of looking at this thing and you're sort of looking at what you hope it is rather than kind of what it is. And Republicans are more guilty of this than anything than, than Democrats. And they sort of, they don't see the flaws of the American regime as something essential to the American regime. They think that they can somehow be separated. They think that they can kind of keep these structures, these ideals, this belief system while, you know, basically curing it of this virus or of this bacterium. I just don't think it's a virus or a bacterium. I think it's something very much essential to the form. After counterpo well, Before so Counterpoint's response, uh, I just want to say real quick, I want to make sure we go back to Russia versus Ukraine after that response. But uh, Counterpoint's, go ahead. Yeah, so so let's, um, let's say that this is like a... Let me just accept your analogy on its face and say, like, let, let's say this is like genetic cancer. OK, genetic like genetic cancer. It's, it's within one. it's within the structure of the body itself. It was designed a certain way. It propagated. That propagation was faulty. It's like you have one of those cancer causing mutations like BRCA1, something. Like right. That. So. So, yeah. So the error at first is not particularly noticeable. But over time, it replicates, replicates, replicates until eventually it becomes malignant and kills the body. Let, let's just say it's that way. So for me, what I would like to know, so, so if, I, if I had to diagnose a, a variety of the problems that America has, um, I am of the group that you were kind of talking about where I think it's a virus. Um, I think that America is a relatively healthy body when you look at the history of uh, humankind. I think that as far as like a republic goes or a democracy or whatever you want to talk about, as far as like the, the statuses of governments throughout history, I think we've achieved a lot of really interesting things. I also think that we're sitting on a treasure trove of not just like material wealth and land wealth, but we're also sitting on intellectual wealth, uh, kind of unlike the rest of the world is seen. I think that when we look at what like uh, America is capable of, I'm talking about the United States, but also the American continent. I think we're perfectly capable of being a power that could be that could rival the greatness of Rome and perhaps the longevity of Rome. Um, so I, I think that like that is entirely within the cards for us if we played the cards right. So when I look at the woke mind virus or communism or socialism or, or like neo reactionary fascist bullshit. I view these things as viruses and diseases that we could take out with a shot of penicillin, but that penicillin is going to be good public policy. That's like driven home by intelligent, passionate, responsible leaders in our society um, where and I don't I don't see anybody doing that, by the way. Um, as a matter of fact, this is where your structural cancer argument could be made is that everyone, because we live in an individualist society, everyone is uh, designed to look out rawly for themselves or their little tribal group. So the liver and the heart and the lungs are all designed to fight each other, not to come together in order to create something better for the entire corporate body. 
So if I think that we could take this out with a shot of penicillin, if I think that we could start eating good food on a metaphorical level, start working out on a metaphorical level, go to sleep at a reasonable time and all that kind of, you know, bullshit that you want to like, which is like have less wars, educate your people properly, uh, you know, all that kind of bullshit. That's what I think we could do. So since you disagree, what is your cancer and what is your chemotherapy in your metaphorical lens? So my grandmother recently passed away. Uh, she was 108 years old. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully I have good genes in that respect. And, uh, you know, the idea that my grandmother could have restored herself by like eating better food and, you know, going for longer runs every day or whatever, uh, you know, could only have been mentioned by someone who hadn't met her. Did, and, did, did and, she smoke and, and drink? Um, uh, no, um, maybe she should. Did she eat right? Did she go to bed at a reasonable time? Um, I don't think any of those would have made her, um, he made it to 108 years old, that is captain of the cheerleading squad in 2022. And, uh, so, you know, in any case, you know, so when you basically say Washington should eat right and eat better food, I'm like, have you, have you been? Been, been to Washington, no. right? You know, and 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 like and so and and you and you know, almost there's something remarkable when you say we. It's almost the royal we. We should do this. We should do that. Well, you know, there's no we in Washington. There's kind of various buildings and various offices and various like you know, kind of you know um, groups pulling and pushing against each other. Uh, but you know, there's no there's no we. No one's in charge in D.C. There's nothing like that, right? And so you know, when I say you know, what is the thing? I would compare when you talked about all the greatness in America. It's true. There's a lot of greatness in America, uh, you know, and. <clears throat> And I think that, you know, actually there's a lot of greatness and there's a lot of leadership ability in America. It's just that the federal government does not run in any way, shape or form on leadership ability. But uh, is there a lot of leadership ability? Yeah, sure. And and so. Like when I look at it, it seems very similar to Rome around the coming of the Caesars in which basically Rome was really a healthy rising power in many respects. There was a lot to be said for Rome, but also the government of the Senate had basically proven it's just complete incapacity. And, you know, the, the result of that system was constant civil wars. And so it was replaced with the imperial system under the leadership of a very couple of very thoughtful individuals, Julius and Augustus Caesar. Caesar. Uh, you know, later it had issues of its own. It was certainly not perfect. Nothing's perfect. Uh, I think we could do better, but like you could clearly do a lot better. The preserving the Roman Republic was just not possible at that time. Moreover, one of the things that you see is that, you know, in this sort of spread of when you go back to your Maslow's pyramid of needs and your self-actualization, the need of the population at large for the self-actualization of participating in per, you know political power, which is always essentially a narcissistic need, especially if it conflicts with the actual needs of government of the country, which it often does. You know, you can go to China today. China is booming. China is doing great. People in China don't really seem to need that form of self-actualization. They're quite happy, like, making stuff for us uh, yeah. and, and getting rich. Till their it. population and, numbers I was about run to say, out. I, I have plenty of objections here, but continue. <laughs> but, but like, and, and, and so, you know, again, when I, when, I, when I look at this sort of case for this kind of mechanism of oligarchy that actually governs, when you say we should do this, do you mean the voters should command the oligarchy to change their policies in this way? Do you expect that to work? Do you believe in that sort of that that kind of power channel is open? Are you hoping to convince no. the oligarchy, which sort of, you know, you've critiqued very effectively as kind of, you know, the sort of bunch of independent players kind of following their own interests in some ways. You know, if you think that the regime as it is can be changed in the directions that you prefer, like I sort of I find that very unconvincing knowing 
this oligarchy as I do, never having worked in it, but kind of having grown up in it. And I'm just like, well, you're, I find yeah, this very, actually my, my policies are much more realistic because there's no question that they can be implemented because any regime can end. Whereas your sort of demands for change seem just like utterly unrealistic to me. So you're for top yeah, down so, rule, to be clear. So um, basically, a top down rule. Yeah. Oh, the, sure. I would just I would just rebuild the government like I would build, you know, when it comes, for example, to the State Department, I'm like, OK, you know, the State Department is like the perfect example of like a completely unnecessary office because its only job was to supervise this regime. And if the foreign policy of the new president is basically the foreign policy of Vattel's law of nations, you so no longer need basically what we have in the U.S. Embassy. You have Paris. a fucking like, rule book that you can literally just go through. <laughs> we have 200 Americans ruling Paris. The only reason assemblies, embassies have been obsolete since the telegraph was invented. Okay, right. You know, basically the policy of the U.S. toward the government of France should be very, very simple. Uh, number one, we'll uh, have an equal balance of trade, so we'll sell you as much as we give you. Number two, whoever's in charge in Paris is the government of France for us. You can kind of you can paint a big QR code on a on a parking lot, you know, to to show who's in charge, and and we'll uh, if we have anything to say to you, uh, we'll uh, we'll talk to that email address and um, we'll communicate <laughs> any issues over email. Uh, ideally, we'll maybe even make the email public. But, you know, sometimes things get a little more complicated in international affairs. You know, you might have I, to zoom. I was about to say. You might have to Zoom. You're... You might have to work out. You know, suppose you have a really complicated issue, like, for example, like a migratory bird. Ordinarily, the birds go up and down. They go north, south like that. Sometimes they get lost. There's a storm, you know, and the bird gets off course. And then you have to call, you know, Paris. And you're like... You know, we have the bird, birds, right? And they're course. like, oh, ho, 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 you have the bird. You know, you must send us the bird, right? You know, the bird comes back, right? You know, a lot of complicated negotiations. What does the bird have to eat, you know, during this? Like, you know, this is, this to me is what foreign policy should be about, been. right? Right, oh, no drama, just like, you know, we have the bird, right? You know, these are important things mm. for nations to discuss. Otherwise, you got an ocean between you. It's pretty straightforward. Nobody can, like, walk across the border or anything. Not that that should be allowed. All right, but top-down no dictator, election. what could possibly go wrong? Counterpoints. Okay, yeah. So, all right. So, so he, here's my here's my thing with this. So, I'm I'm okay with saying that your model uh, is elegantly simple and almost beautifully so. Okay, I, I'm I'm perfectly fine with conceding that. That being said, I don't think that your model is any more close to fruition than mine, barring like a complete societal collapse. So uh, that, can I that's explain kind of, how my model comes to fruition? If you I, I, I would uh, like to explain mine first. Um, okay. So for me, because I'm raised American, relatively individualist, et cetera, et cetera. Um, no, I don't have any faith in oligarchs to come down from their high clouds and save me from the American system that's been set up. I have no, uh, you know, beliefs that anybody is going to save me or it really anybody is going to necessarily serve me besides like, you know, municipal government is going to do what municipal government does. Right. That's about it. Um, so when it comes to this thing, what I expect the American government to do is to serve their self-interest and keep the global market open. I expect them to create and protect the $65 trillion commercial empire that they've already created. And the reason why they'll do that is because they're self-interested in that. Mm, um, no, no, when, no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, let me finish, let me finish. So when it comes to what I think we can do as far as like eating our vegetables and all that kind of shit, I don't think we need the government to do that. I think we can already do that here. Um, I think that, you know, by having intelligent people who have studied the world and history and all that kind of stuff, I think that we can, you know, talk to the American people and talk about our problems and solutions and what we want to do and how to improve their lives and whether or not they should trust or do anything with government and, you know, where the government is fucked up and why it's wrong and all that kind of shit. And I think that, like, uh, you know, if there's if there's a bunch of wall Martians, uh, people who want to live, work and eat and sleep at Walmart and they want to eat trash food and they want to do that, they can devolve into the worst, you know, parts of humanity that's ever existed. And if there's people who are looking for more, then they can find that. And we can build a digital community 
uh, that's you know half online, half digital, that is made up of the people who are looking for something more, who want something more out of their lives, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't think we should be reliant on the government at all. Mm. But I do want to go back to Russia versus Ukraine, because that was the main thing that we were talking about earlier. And going back to the Manslow's hierarchy of needs, we were talking so much about uh, all of these uh, you know, self-actualizations that some bureaucrats up in the hill may want to unleash to the entire world. That, to me, regarding Ukraine, is far less important or even that noticeable compared to the bigger situation, which is, do we want Russia to acquire this territory? And how much will we bet that Russia is going to continue? Curtis, you already know my position regarding Russia's, uh, or Putin's rather, plans to improve upon the USSR going all the way back to the Russian Empire as far as where the borders are. But I would also contend that once you have a little bit of power, it's very... Uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to say, okay, I've gotten this much, let's keep going. What's going to stop me? And that's when we get into, sure, Poland maybe, Germany maybe, some nation will eventually have a hot war with Russia if it keeps going. But do we necessarily want that to happen as well? So that's I, where, I don't yeah. even think that's on the table. They can barely handle Ukraine right like, now. Like, yes, what? but again, why? Because America was supporting them. So it's, it goes back to the original question of what is the role of the Western sphere when it comes to countries uh, doing what Russia did right now? And that's why I think, like, do we want to get into a situation where we have these hot wars with these regional European powers and the but would-be I, I contender? Think... I, I think the liberal, the liberal answer, sorry, I'll give you the liberal answer because it's probably shorter. The liberal answer to this is, 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 you, um, is you push it as far as you can go. So, for instance, if, you, if Ukraine collapsed or whatever, we would still have Latvia, Estonia, Poland, all that kind of stuff. We would still have NATO. We would have the Finns joining NATO. American global hegemony or whatever, competition with BRIC and all that kind of shit. That, that global competition would still be on regardless of what happens in Ukraine. So like the, the liberal project is like it's like an eternal crusade. It's going to continue until the entire world is watching Queer Eye for the Straight Guy and fucking. No, I disagree. Uh, I disagree. Kind of I don't think me, Poland's me... watching Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. And yeah, I don't. Yeah, give they them, will. Give them, give them, give, they will. They will. They will. They, they will. Give them a while. You know, Why? They, Why they... will they? Uh, because um, fashion flows downward. You know, my my mother was. Um, in, in Spain in the early to mid 60s, she was an American au pair in Spain, and this was Franco's Spain. And Franco won everything on the ground. He restored Spain. No, he did not want to invade the world just because he was an authoritarian. He was happy ruling Spain, and in fact, he wanted to integrate Spain with the global economy, which he did. He integrated it financially, even which may have been a mistake. And he had educated um, the uh, the legitimate king of Spain, Juan Carlos, uh, as uh, you know the, the the you know the most Catholic king or whatever um, the king of Spain is is traditionally called. And um, you know everything was set for basically this like super trad country to continue into the 21st century and beyond. And instead, you know that never happened because the kids were just all into blue jean and the stone blue jeans and the stones and the beetles as my mother observed in the spain the very catholic spain of the 60s and all that shit just fell apart and it fell apart because people naturally sex and drugs and rock and roll sex and drugs first of all they like sex and drugs and rock and roll and more importantly or like it's hard to know which is more important they also like power and so they were responding to the most powerful force in the world, which was clearly not in Madrid, but rather in London. And so now Spain is one of the most ir irreligious countries. Et but they did not the get the and commie vaccination that the USSR brought to the Eastern uh, European powers. Have you heard of the Spanish Civil War? Yes, I heard. Like they got yeah, and Franco won. And Franco there. won. And that and, was a different and, story because Franco sure, was a and, rightist. And, and the That's the kind is, of vaccination they got. So people, it actually makes people, sense that they would actually reject a lot of that Francoist stuff sure, and go the other and, way. And, and like and like I can tell you that if you go and hang out in like cool parties in Warsaw, you find people who believe in the gay and believe in all sure. of these things. You have that and everywhere. Sure. You have so these what? ignorant law and justice party, uh, you know, voters out in the countryside who are willing to vote for, um, you know, the uh, the Polish Trump twins. Basically, I guess there's only one of them now. 
and because the Russians killed the other one. But the um, um, this is very bad Polish history. I'm not saying this. Um, uh, it's like a Polish joke. But but in any case, the like, yeah, like you know, come on, liberalism is the coolest thing in the world. Like you don't think? Well, it's cool no. To okay, there's something. Polish. Let me give you my alternate. Mm -hmm. Let me give you my alternate proposal for a moment. Okay. Sure. You know, you asked like how how your your world comes about and your answer is just like, well, you know, obviously the regime is going to keep on doing its regimes thing. So let's so like, it's not their the job. Praxis. Let's join yeah. the Praxis Society and go to cool parties in Soho. And and the um, I've been to those parties. I like them. They're good parties. And I endorse the Praxis Society parties. And and the um, in any case, um you're like, okay, how does my world come about? So my world comes about when, let's say, uh, Donald uh, um, uh, Trump with, um, you know, 170 indictments hanging over his head, just like uh, Caesar uh, coming back from Gaul under the sanction of the Senate, but uh, much older and much, um, you know, sort of, uh, I don't think Trump is the greatest. Octogenarian? American. Yeah, exactly. He's an octogenarian, but, you know, maybe maybe he gets some some he has better luck with advisors this time and basically realizes that the right thing for him to do as president is not to be chief executive, a role for which he is spectacularly unsuited, but rather chairman of the board, a role for which he is spectacularly well suited. And he chooses rather as his chief executive, someone with like true energy and skill. Let's say, for example, he chooses the chief executive of OpenAI, Sam Altman, who happens to be uh, a gay American. And how he's a liberal, so he's a, he's a Democrat, and he's basically like Sam, like your job is to build a new government. We're not going to bother reforming the old one. We're just going to retire them, and we're going to build a new one. We're going to staff it up really fast. Now, Sam Altman happened to, you know, the reason I picked his name, rather than a, besides being a, an excellent chief executive, he used to run this accelerator called Y Combinator. So he can probably find, like, you know, 5,000 like amazing managers basically by sending an email by next Wednesday. So he knows, you know, we here in Silicon Valley, I'm not really one of these people, but like we know how to like staff shit up fast. Okay. And so let's examine the kind of foreign policy that this like incredible duo would pursue. So you're like, okay, you know, let's say you've thought about the way the U.S. should relate to France. You know, it's like, we sell them cars. They sell us wine, something like that. Keep the keep the trade balanced. You know, no no bilateral net investment. And you know, um, if the bird gets lost, you you have to send them back, right? You know, and 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 tourism tourism is good too, right? You know, that's basically the relationship that I believe should partain between the U.S. of France, regardless of the government of France, and you know. Uh, the French, they're very fickle people. They're very mercurial. It could be democracy. It could be some kind of fascism. They could have Louis the 20th. They could go communist. It could be Scientology. Maybe it's Scientology. Maybe the French will go for Scientology. We wish them well with that. They'll all be on the e-meters. Maybe we can sell them <laughs> e-meters. Right, you know, um, but as long but as their Bordeaux is not poisoned, as long as it's still good and dry and kind of tannic and has that kind of cedar cigar box taste, you know, um, I'll keep drinking it, you know, and things will be good. Well, like, and, and as long as France and doesn't so conquer other is, places and reduces them into a pile of crap, that's the other part um, of it, too. Uh, right? That like, is not my experience of French imperialism. I think French actually, they even did a great job with Mexico while the U.S. was having its civil war. You know, if Maximilian and his, and, and his descendants were still in power in Mexico, like sure. things would be a much better well, that's place. Well, fact, Curtis, you know, this is kind of my point, though, because I don't expect France to be conquering, I don't know, like Italy or whatever, just like I don't expect America to be conquering well, no know, Norway, see, even if Norway's got a lot of oil and we want see, that oil. Here's the, here's we're not the conquering thing, Norway. Though, what you see... You know, let's examine the effect of these policies on, you know, the po on, on the politics of Europe. OK, and so, you know, Donald Trump, you know, you know Trump of 47 I, is, that, is that the number is elected. And this time he means it. OK, <laughs> this time, this time, this time it's real.
It's real. We, before we were just playing. We were just pretending. <laughs> this time he doesn't have any choice. So it's real. It's real. It's actually happening, right? Humpty Dumpty is actually coming off the wall, right? And 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 the way in which he handles this is he basically says what actually happens to this American presence in Europe, all this embassy, all these bases, whatever, you know, are basically treated like the um, departure from Afghanistan. We're just like get on a plane and go like you're out you're done and and your message to the french people is uh hey you know what the occupied uh, it's like the fall of of east germany it's just like you know okay you know you had this government we put it there we backed it we sponsored it we supported it uh now things are going back to like however you want to do them at which point you know the french for example consider the response of the french basically you're like wow you know Paris. What if we made it look like Paris again? Like we have old films from like the twenties. What if Paris of the twenty twenties looked like Paris? Wouldn't that just involve kicking place? out all the Muslims and shit? What would we have to do to make that happen? I, it's none of my business. You know, I don't like. You know, it's none of my business. It's just like maybe you want more Muslims. I don't know. Maybe everyone becomes Muslim. Like like Welbeck. Like that's cool with us. Like. <laughs> I guess that might, you know, have a problem with the quality of the wine, right? You know, maybe you could have kind of like a French, like a Gallic. <laughs> yeah, kind of I was about to say that would very that much would be the pro quality wine. of the wine. Yeah. You know, I would hope that, like, you know, there would be sensible regulations, even in California, prohibiting overly sweet Cabernets, which I think is a really, it's like a, you know, it's like okay. climate change to me. All it's right, really listen, listen counterpoint you know, time. I've, counter I've points tolerated time. your, yeah, I, I've tolerated the, the fantasy for long enough. Uh, <laughs> one, I don't think. It is no think, dream if you make it real. Yeah, well, I don't think you're, I don't think Donald Trump is capable of making your dream. Nobody real. should be. And, he should be. Like yeah, and, he's not. And, make and our also, dreams and real again. But what if he got stem cells? What if he got a stem cell injection in his brain? And he was <laughs> okay, no, from the beginning of old. Like, like Theoden. Like, like Theoden in, in, in Lord of the Rings. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, counterpoints. Go for it. Wormtongue, yeah. who is Jared. He rises again. <laughs> Like you know, yeah, he's still a draft dodging philanderer octogenarian. Yeah, so... you don't know what Theoden's past, right? You only hear the good <laughs> stuff about Theoden. Like, you know, what did Theoden do when he was a kid? Like, how many lines of coke did Theoden do? Like, okay. you know, he was just railing so on these like fucking number two point, pencils, right? right? The point being, I I think the chances of your dream happening are less than mine, and mine is the American Empire keeps spinning. Maybe not perfectly. We might be, you know, like Cicero or whatever. I think he was in the year 500. He predict like he predicted Rome's fall like three or four hundred years before it actually fell to the Visigoths and shit. So like, like so basically, there, there's still plenty of time left in you know the empire, and you should enjoy it while it's around. So enjoy it while it's around. Create what you can from it. Try to create a better society. Try to get as many people to eat their vegetables and go to sleep at a reasonable time as you possibly can. Uh, wag your finger at the oligarchs and maybe one or two of them will eventually listen to you so they don't entirely collapse the society instantaneously. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that, that would my hope would actually to be to convince the oligarchs that it's actually in their best interest to not collapse the society by viewing everybody as a bunch of like slave chattel that that would mm. be my ideal do you think, do you um, think you the chances said of it the happening same, is low do you think you would have said the same thing if you were you but you know lived in moscow yeah, if i was a celtic it, it, if, if, if i was a celtic in, roman citizen in rome during no no the no more rome, specific, I think I would more have said specific. The same thing. what what if you lived in moscow in 1985 what if I would have said that the empire still has some time left and we can save it, but we should convince some of the oligarchs to actually pay attention and fucking take care of the society before it collapses under the weight of itself? Um, maybe, but but I also think that there's a lot of things that were going on in Moscow and Russia that uh, sure. aren't Very, similar to ours. So, so for instance, like whenever, place. yeah, when you when you look at like Russian programs, products, operations, all that kind of stuff. They make really cool shit, but often what happens is like there's uh, there's a lack of logistical commitment on the back end to their shit. Yeah. And so yeah. as a result, they make some of the coolest like military and aeronautical yeah. products on the fucking planet. But, you know, they can do the cool thing like six or seven times. But on the eighth time, it's going to explode. I have to put um, in a plug. So... I have to put in a plug for a movie here that I saw. Are you aware that the Wagner group made a movie? 
Did I talk about this last time? No. Wagner, oh my God, it's okay, so Wagner to me is music, but Wagner, it, like Wagner okay. is the fucking mercenary. Wagner, so you're just Wagner, Wagner. I, you know, whatever, whatever, Wagner, I'll say Wagner. I don't know how you say okay. it in Russian, but, well, uh, you know, be, they made, Wagner. you know, Prigozhin, 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 you know, the leader of Putin's the cook. owner of Wagner. He's a Jew, you know, and he's just great. I love him. And one of the things he did was he funded and, you know, he actually like I think they should just give the Ministry of Defense to Prigozhin. I think he could really revitalize shit there because they've got a lot of Sovaks, you know, and and, you know, this man is not a Sovak. You know, Wagner is a startup. Right. And one of the things they did was they did they made a film. They made a two hour film fictional scripted feature film of basically urban fighting in the Russian Ukrainian war with the sides just called white and yellow. It's dramatic. Heavy equipment is used. The production values are extremely high. And the great thing about this film, which I really recommend everyone find a copy of illicitly and watch is that the actors in it are all like actual Wagner mercenaries, right? These are guys who are actually, so it's like sort of watching you know, it's like if you watch the film about the NFL and it was made with like stuntmen, you know, and like Brad Pitt, right? You're like, okay, whatever. You know, the shots have to be tight, whatever. Maybe it can be realistic. But if that same film is made with actual NFL players, it's like a different thing. And and that's what you're seeing if you see Wagner Best in Hell. It's not going to win an Oscar. It's not going to be seen in theaters, but it deserves to be. And like, I think when we look at these wars, basically, despite the number of people that have died, I think we have to set that against, you know, you said democracy, human rights, you know, whatever. Maybe the Ukrainians will win and we'll get some democracy and human rights or whatever. Maybe that's... <coughs> more european products you know better audis whatever for sale um you know with with actual cars. White market white market titles French but like wine. you know that could be one of the benefits of killing you know hundreds of thousands of people but i think you know we shouldn't overlook one of the other benefits which is all the it's amazing great russian footage, war films all the amazing footage that has come out of this war you know because we have war in an era when basically anyone can film and so that war is recorded and we'll be able to watch like mm -hmm. war porn i mean our children will be watching war porn from the all right war, at this point i just feel can't... like you're memeing so listen <laughs> the, the point yeah, yeah we're gonna fine. get a super the... chat soon yeah so the, the <laughs> we might is... want we might want to go to the super chat because i you know i'm sorry i was a little punch drunk with that one i was i, I, I apologize no, i don't okay actually the... consider that people should die for war porn but no, then it's, you have the it's fine. Stuff, no, so. it's I'm sure you can make great mm. YouTube videos out of it. Commercial. Well, no, since uh, since, of Curtis, uh, no, the, since Curtis, since Curtis, you should were... go to the people in the film, though. Like that's a defect in the market. Well, counterpoints yeah, before before you, kind of royalty system. Counterpoints exactly. before you go on. Uh, Cur QR codes. Curtis, mm -hmm. since you did uh, say again about this thing about the hundred thousand people, you know, is going to be worth it to have the Audis and all that. Several several hundred thousand. If like, okay, like, yeah. if we have a situation where Putin says, you know what, guys, if you the United States, if the United States does not give up sovereignty to me, then I'm going to blow you guys up with nukes, okay? If we want to avoid any kind of conflict of that nature, then yes, the easiest thing to do is just to give it up, whether we're talking about places in Europe, or Ukraine, whether we're talking about Moldova, or whether we're talking about the U.S. If we want to avoid any conflict on Earth whatsoever, then obviously we have to spread our legs open for whoever wants to come in. Well, you know, what you'll find is that you'll find if you characterize America's sort of enemies as like the demons that they're supposed to be, and there's, there's plenty of like demonic stuff to go around. But like, honestly, when I look back at, for example, the Cold War, uh, you know, certainly the russia was a lot more aggressive in that era than it is now putin is pretty meek compared even to the brezhnev regime and like even the brezhnev even the world the stalin just like wasn't like that wasn't that's just like kind of thing is not like a real thing for people like this is kind of has this like kind of video game fantasy tone i think the ussr's leadership was very scared of the U.S. I think that basically they knew very well that, you know, in 1945, the U.S. wanted the USSR to become essentially a satellite state, which would converge with 
you know, kind of American dominated worldwide institutions that the U.S. wanted it to become a member of the international community. And they were just like, fuck you, this is not going to happen. And that's basically how the Cold War happened. But, you know, honestly, I don't even like think really Hitler had that level of, a, of, of intent. I think the right thing to do with Hitler would have been to do simply um, evacuate the Jews from whatever territory he conquered. And that was one of the one thing that FDR had absolutely no will to do because he felt that he would have been solving one of Hitler's problems for him. What about and, what about the Poles? What about all the other people that the uh, Nazis were taking over there? Sure, uh, you Fuck know, Westphalian uh, society or Westphalian sovereignty. I mean, sovereignty. have you heard of you Fuck know? Him. Do you have the same kind of beef with like Frederick the Great? You know, mm. like like are you yeah. still mad about? I mean, if we go back, if we what go about, back to what, what about, happened what there the with Welsh? World War II, like are you like it was Welsh Britain? It was Britain that declared war on Germany. The war was not declared on Britain by Germany, and the reason being is that they overstepped into Poland, and they had a deal that Poland was going to be protected by the British Empire, and that was important to keep uh, one's uh, end of the bargain. Yes, it was um, um, a deal that Poland was going to be protected by the British Empire in a blank check style that had never happened before in British diplomacy, happening at a time when basically the Poles were abusing their German minority. And essentially the deal that Hitler offered Poland, admittedly in a sense, this would have provided, you know, made Polish a German, Poland a German rather than a British uh, satellite state. Ironically, the Polish regime at the time was even more fascist and anti-Semitic than the German regime of the time. Um, and the Germans were like, okay, you know, the weir this weird stuff created by Versailles, which every intellectual in Europe in the 1920s agreed was a terrible idea, um, you know, is fucked. And what we would like is uh, basically for you to treat your German minorities a little bit better and also to have a railroad uh, or I think maybe an Autobahn even between um, across what used to be West Prussia between the isolated enclave of East Prussia and the rest of Germany. And, you know, the sort of the the basically the feeling of the polls in that negotiation, number one, on paper, the polls actually thought they could possibly win a war with Germany, uh, in part because of the backing of the English and the French of the military backing of the England of uh, England of England and France, which, which was actually non-existent when the time came. Moreover, they were very surprised when they were simultaneously invaded by the USSR, but the, US, the England and France declared war on Germany, not on the USSR, because um, that was uh, you know, part of their secret diplomacy of the time. I mean, if you think the alliance of the West of the allies in the USSR is an alliance of convenience against, uh, you know, Hitler, you'd be very surprised, you know, to read the, uh, the diaries of, um, of Maisky, the Russian ambassador to England, which have since been published where he's basically, you know, chilling and having drinks with Churchill in 1938 and talking about exactly the same alignment that later occurred. And so, you know, to, like the relationship between the USSR and the allies is extremely complex and it is extremely complex well before 1941. Much more and, extremely complex than you uh, wrote Eastern Europe was, which I agree with you on actually, like in that Substack article, I do agree that this bullshit about Eastern Europe uh, being declared as, you know, this overly complex thing that you can't understand. Like I said before, I think they got an injection of communism, which made them, uh, I think, look the other way and will make them look the other way when it comes to a lot of these more uh, woke policies in the future. But be that as it may, we got to get to Super Chats. But before the Super, super chats. chats, wait, but before the Super Chats, just a couple of more points here that I wanted to uh, remark about based on our last stream with you and me, Curtis. So one of the things that you were mentioning was why is it that – uh, Ukraine uh, did not. Uh, no, Ukraine. no, I will not. Ukraine. Slava <laughs> Ukraina. Slava Geroim. I love dead naming. I love dead naming. One. Ukraine. It's like. That uh, the, question, the question, the question, yeah, the question was, the question was, why weren't they able to get into uh, NATO? And one thing that I failed to mention was that the areas like the contested areas, Lugansk and so on, 
Russia intentionally did not want to get those areas into its own orbit. It did not want Lugansk. You said Lugansk. Do you mean Luhansk? Luka... Surely you would say Luhansk. What? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. I, I know you're being an ass. Um, <laughs> so. Russia intentionally did not want those border areas to become part of its own sphere, you know, to become part of its own government, because it knew that if Ukraine had thorns in its side, it would not be able to join NATO. And that's one thing that I think people kind of forget about the situation, that this idea that, you know, poor Russia was being beset on all sides by the evil West, when way back then it already made strides to make sure that their neighbors are never even going to think about joining NATO. And to your example, talking about... Well, whether... they've definitely been thinking about joining NATO. Like, uh, they've been more than thinking about joining NATO. Yeah, but they could actually for... become de facto members of NATO, with their whole militaries being... Now now, yes, but back, but back then, just so you understand, I mean that was a continuing process. That process started. You can hear Victoria Newland talking about that process in like 2017, right? You know, how do you feel about Victoria Newland? Is she? Are you a fan? Look, are if she if like, she's hanging handing out cookies, how would you, how would you rate her? How would you rate uh, Victoria? If Newland? she's handing out cookies somewhere, if she's handing out cookies somewhere where you have an election going on, yes, she definitely has an interest in elections going a certain way. But to me, that's not enough. Proof proof that she is necessarily the mastermind puppeteering you know a, a fake election well, you, did, you did hear that leaked call right but like yeah you know, so like what the, that doesn't just, that doesn't no, impress it's, me it's, it's not See, her some people some people will hear that call personally. and be like oh my god the western puppet master it's like yeah of course no shit sherlock of course she's gonna want know, certain this, results for yeah, ukraine this weird Who cares? Thing where people acknowledge what Every day they sort of acknowledge what this thing actually is, and then they just go around keeping using words like ally and shit. It drives me nuts. Like No, okay, but I'm uh, not. Okay, I know counterpoints. we got to get to the super uh, chats. One last thing I wanted to say is that Ukraine currently has two armies, one of which is being partially trained in England right now. So that whole thing that Caldwell wrote uh, in that link uh, in your substack about this World War One style entrenchment right now, the only reason from what I understand that entrenchment is the way it is is because – one part of Ukraine's army is intentionally maintaining that entrenchment while the other part of Ukraine's army, because you got to keep in mind, a lot of these are like young people who do not know how to handle a lot of this weaponry and don't have the training. Right now, they are being upgraded. They are being upgraded in England or wherever else they're being trained. So then they could actually make the advancement deeper into uh, all these other places like Crimea, for example. And oh, and by the way, one last thing, counterpoint, I'm so sorry, but I got to say this personal story about my relatives there who moved to Crimea, because this is uh, important mm. to this whole conversation. They moved into Crimea after 2014, and uh, this is on my, my dad's side, and they were uh, so happy about being able to get, like, almost for free, like, the super cheap property, and uh, they said, oh, oh some, uh, some Tatars, some Tatars lived there, you know, and then they fled. The reason being is that the Tatars did not want to uh, be uh, part of this whole, uh, you know, Russia taking over bullshit. So they fled and they were persecuted by the Russians. And so now these relatives ended up getting this completely, you know, almost free property within that region. But the idea that, oh, the people who were living there just wanted Russia to be there. And that's why, uh, you know, they uh, acquiesced to well, it. The, I mean, the Crimean Tatars are like 3% of the population. Uh, you know, they, they weren't exactly deported like Stalin. I'm not sure how they were discriminated against, but, you know, given that uh, the Ukraine, uh, you know, uh, has like laws banning the Russian language and stuff, I think that and loves to like. No, you no, know, you're like, over I you're over stretching. You're over stretching think, the I Russian that, language uh, laws. That was just like for official documents and stuff like that. The people really? who were. Yeah, the people who were living there, they were not being persecuted just because they were speaking Russian and were Russians. They were friendly with their neighbors who were Ukrainians. So it's a completely different story. But anyway, let's go on to Super Chats. I've been so boxing it for enough time here and again curtis thank you so much and connor counterpoints thank you Pleasure. so much you were bringing Enjoy. the fire today man i love it all right here we go we start from and everybody subscribe once again we start from mad perfect two canadian no 220 canadian dollars was just waiting for a new curtis yarvin stream and here it is Amarendi, 5,000 yen, which is like 30-something dollars. I appreciated my Japanese friend. 
in honor of the return of the King's Theater <laughs> re-release this weekend. Curtis, you've mentioned the scouring of the Shire being one of your favorite parts from the book, but haven't gone into much detail. Could you please elaborate for the audience? Well, the scouring of the Shire is like great because it's like basically sort of this kind of picture of the restoration of noble rule under, you know, this like filthy third world Shire that's kind of developed in the absence of like the the good hobbits with their flashy swords and sort of, you know, the closest equivalent of the scouring of the Shire that's happening, you know, today, right now, of course, is President Bukele's cleanup of El Salvador, which I think is one of the most important events currently in the world. And by the way, before the next Super Chat, according to the 2001 Ukrainian census, Crimean Tatars accounted for 12.1% of the population of Crimea. Yeah, yeah, Despite but they did 50%. They of the did population. 50%. But they did 50. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Fucking hell. All right. You know it's bad. Uh, when in the same direction. God, everyone, everyone has the same response. That's 1250, 1250, 1250, 1250. Colin. Colin donated $5. Thank you, Colin. Uh, counterpoints. Uh, no, this isn't fair. Counterpoints is coming off as rude and angry. Oh, come on, come on. I'm Shut, rude the and angry. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. He was very, given my like tendency to ramble on, and like he was he was actually very, very nice and cool. That was a great, Colin, great match. Fuck you. Thanks for your five bucks. <laughs> Brett Burntoff, $2. Who is defending Russia in this conversation? Wow. I, you know, I think Russia is what most people <laughs> think it is. The problem is bit. the State Department is not what most people think it is. That's that's where I am. I'm yeah, like, actually, I don't have any the... illusions about Putin. You know, no, he's not my... a world dominator. He's just a little, you know, kind of petty little monarch. Let him be. Yeah. You know? No, but the scary my... thing is that you think Prigozhin's going to be better. Like, you don't like Putin because he's ineffective. But if there was like some kick-ass totalitarian dictator, like, would you be impressed? Prigozhin's or... a lot more fun. Like, Prigozhin's got style. I think Putin is like... I think, you know, I'm Prigozhin's a Jew. How can I not be for that, right? <laughs> uh, well, my my yeah. takeaway, unfortunately, is going to be like, I thought that uh, the State Department and the Department of Defense were run by a bunch of like 50-year-old monomaniacal manipulative monsters who are getting kickback deals from their corporations no, in order no, to do no, that. No, no. They're just, and they're fucking really Curtis over here. They're yeah, great, and Curtis over here is saying, people. That's, like, you could have a beer that's them, an like, accident. Yeah, what, what Curtis is saying is that's an accident, and who it's really run by is a bunch of fucking ideal, fucking liberal, fucking West Wing watching dickheads who like love the smell of their own farts, which is actually a, a scarier world yeah, than if I mean, they're mustache twirling you know, manipulators. Again, like you could hang out with these people, right? You know, like if they're cool people, it's fine, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work. The system doesn't work. Uh, uh, another one from Colin, uh, our wonderful Colin. $5. Uh, no, no, before that, another $5 here uh, from Colin. Counterpoints is defending the mainstream narrative against Yarvin, who is taking a pragmatic, nuanced perspective from first principles. Okay. I described to you my fucking first principle system. It just happens to be the hegemonic liberal system, which you might not agree with. But just because you... Just because you don't agree with it doesn't mean I can't articulate it from its foundations. As a matter of fact, I think the foundations that I articulated are pretty much what explain like Western history for the past 200 years. And whether or not you take like a cynical view on it, where you just think that this is like the propaganda that people tell themselves at night so they can sleep with the horrific things that they've committed. Or if you think that these people are true believers and they think they're carrying on like a multi hundred year or thousand year crusade for the benefits of individual human beings, it doesn't matter where you land on that spectrum. This is like the propaganda. It was given to me uh, in my water. And also, Lev, by the way, is a fucking a propagandized pawn of the regime who believes similar fucking it's okay. moral you know, foundations. It's like, man, I grew up believing all this stuff, and 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 it's like, and you get so saturated with it. It's like it basically, it's like it's everywhere. You know what it's like? It's like you're a World War veteran, one veteran, and it's like 1927, and like you go to take a shit, and another like piece of shrapnel, you know, drops mm. drops out of your. No, ass, but I you know, I kind like, of oh, yeah. <laughs> It's always in there. It'll always I, be in there. Like, I kind of, uh, no, I kind there. of reject that, though. Maybe it's because I was born in Russia and uh, moved to America, so I wasn't born in America. I always felt kind of like an outsider. I would reject that notion just because 
I take a more, I think, pragma- pragmatic view of the various cultures out there where I'd say, like, yes, when it comes to certain proxy wars and wars that America's had, like Iraq, for instance, there was bad shit that went on with nations that were run by these sadistic dictators that also created crimes against humanity. Like, again, Saddam, no WMDs, fine, but the gassing, the whole, you know, gassing uh, okay. thing, that wasn't great. Uh, Lev, 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 hold on, Curtis, I got it. I got it. Let my okay. autism go for a second. Okay, okay. So, okay, so who gave Iraq the, the precursors to mm. weapons of mass destruction during the 1980s? Was and it why the, did they give it to him? I don't know. Was it the CIA? It was, it was the United States, Germany, and the United Kingdom who gave them precursors to the weapons of mass destruction. The reason why they were doing that was because the Iranian Revolution cut off 50% of the Middle Eastern and North African oil to the Western world. As a result, we couldn't stand Iraq and Saudi Arabia by proxy losing. So we used uh, you know, Iraq as a satellite state. And we sold the Iranians weapons just to keep like open lines of communications for a shit post. Uh, that was the whole Oliver North uh, Iran Contra deal. But then what we really did is we supplied uh, dual use chemicals, including anthrax, botulism, and the precursors for VX to Iraq. And we provided them with uh, CIA agents who consulted on targeting. So as a result, you can actually like attribute probably a few thousand to tens of thousands of people uh, dying in the most horrific ways imaginable because of U.S. intelligence. And also on top of that, we continue to provide uh, dual use chemicals after they use it on Shia, uh, Shia civilians in Iraq. And then finally, uh, one more, uh, you know, shit smear on the fuck, you know, shit icing on the cake. Uh, basically, the we I, I think I already said it. But basically, we knew what they were being used for, and we continued to authorize their export use. There's something called the Rigel Report, um, R-I-E-G-L-E-R-E-P-O-R-T, and it's basically like a congressman interviewing the, or investigating this after the fact. And we approved like five, or the, I think it was the Department of State, uh, but it could be somebody else. They approved 550 different export licenses for the dual-use chemicals after we knew what they were using them for. So it was intentional, for sure. Damn. Spadon was just like, I need this shit to grow weed, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were like, yeah, bro. Like, I'm sure the gas is going to be out really coincidental. Like, I look, that is, that is extremely sad that my point still stands, which is yeah. that when it comes to certain discrimination, I guess you could say, between cultures, and it's a sad state of affairs. I do not approve it. I think it's absolutely evil and horrible. But as it stands right now, America and the West looks differently at other nations that don't have like this very stone age tribal dictatorial uh, desert this system is where this is where curtis and i are uh, probably more unified on the the descriptive even if we're not uh unified on the on the prescriptive and this is what like i want western liberals to deal with because what happens is you have people who are cynical about like the Western liberal project and they point out all these like abuses and heinous war crimes that we tolerate and all that kind of stuff. I want Western liberals who believe in like individual freedom and teaching Afghan fucking schoolgirls, you know, to read and all that kind of shit. I want them to look at the horrors that are committed in their name and then make some level of peace with that. Because you can't just say like, oh, yeah, it's cool that we fucking predator strike, you know, we drone strike that fucking wedding and we killed 40 people who were unrelated to the fucking terrorist organization that we were targeting um, because like some girls in Afghanistan can read. I want you to like, you know, I'm not saying you specifically, but I want liberals to like look at those corpses and look at what they're really talking about excusing before they say, yes, the liberal hegemonic project is worth this blood. Well, I mean, you know, CP, can I can I call you CP? (laughs) Preferably not. But I mean, (laughs) you do you. (laughs) There there, by the way, there was a company sponsoring Tim Dillon's show called CP Beef. Oof, oof, oof. Well, (laughs) I mean, there's a chain of there's a chain of like brew house restaurants around here called BJ's. But, um, right, yeah, you just got to get over the memes at some point. So you, you do you. I all right, all right, all right. All right, all right. At, least I'm, at least I'm not calling you contra points, but, you know, the... the um, I'll take uh, that over, CP. Okay, all right, contra points. Um, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. Everybody, okay, everybody uh, subscribe. I'm saying I want liberals to look at the sins that are committed. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I remember what I was going to ask you. How do, how, do, how do you feel about, CP, how do you feel about the Arab Spring? Uh, the Arab Spring. The Arab um, Spring. 
Yeah, so basically, I, I think it's one of those things where uh, sta- th- this is easily explained by State Department idealists not knowing what they were, you know, biting off more than they mm-hmm. can chew. That that has that written all over it, where they're like, oh, we're supporting uh, pro-democracy forces who are fighting for Western values. Oh, wait, we just caused a whole bunch of, like, dictators that are aligned with us to collapse. Oh, wait, in the power vacuum, a whole bunch of jihadists took over. Oh, wait. Now there's like ethnic strife and inter-ethnic murders that haven't been seen in the region in like 40 or 50 years. So, um, no, I mean, I, I think you can, I think you can look so, at So, I mean, the way, the way, the way, mm-hmm. the way in which I would sort of encapsulate my, you know, you're, it's sort of just like you're looking at like Echo Health Alliance, right? And you're like, oh, wait, we caused a pandemic that killed 10 million people, right? You know, and, and what's weird about this is that basically Echo Health Alliance? Mm-hmm. Not only is this motherfucker not in jail, okay, they still getting grants. They still out there getting grants, okay? Like they're yeah. still getting grants. Like, like how wild is that? It's like you basically like hired like the head of Chernobyl to run like the whole like nuclear program in Russia. But you know, like, you okay, know, but, but and let's... and and you know, with Arab Spring, mm-hmm. if you just let me finish, with the Arab Spring, it's just like that. You know, if you are at state and you're one of these West Wing motherfuckers, you know, you know, basically part of like Obama's Chum gang, and yeah. you know, West Wing watcher, and you basically Don't were like, and and, and you have on your like State Department like personnel record and you know they take that pretty seriously at state or ER and you you were like influential in like you know bringing about like the Arab Spring in Syria like you know that's a highlight man you had an impact you know and so nobody's actually the important thing is like nobody not only is there an incentive for this fuckery because you basically made all of these people and all of their like fans in the media and all the media consumers feel like they were toppling autocracies, man. Autocracies are bad. We were not, we can't prop up those dictators. Right. You know, and not only did it give all these people this fucking cocaine high, remember the pyramidion, right? You know, basically mm-hmm. you're giving these people this cocaine high because if you're toppling a power, you must be powerful yourself. <coughs> So everybody's getting like cocaine, like rushing into their eyeballs, like from watching CNN. And, the, you know, pure cocaine is rushing through the veins of everyone who's working like 20 hours a day to have a revolution in Egypt or whatever the fuck. Mm. Right. You know, it's just like they can't the believe this. If, uh, if, yeah. if like I could, if I could redeem. Orgasm, right. You know, and so to mm. say, well, you know, OK, you know, it didn't turn out like it should have. We bit off too much. No, motherfucker, you were biting the wrong thing. Right. You know, like you shouldn't bite well, so like, I know we got Lev, I know like we got like, much yeah, we, we, like yeah we got we got a few on, we got on, a few more on, super on, chats we we can oh, we can do this like we can do this again or some shit yeah so let's, let's, uh, let's okay, do it again okay, let's, okay. let's, yeah, let's do the Arab Spring let's get on more super chance we gave, we gave this motherfucker too much <laughs> yeah money. and I really <laughs> wanted to defend the U.S. military talking about how they uh, bombed Yugoslavia by letting people know in advance and only bombed the military buildings am I right am I wrong counterpoints am I wrong on that no as far as I I don't give a shit about fucking Serbs whining because because they wow. weren't allowed to do a genocide. I don't give two fucks wow. about that. Oh, there we go. Go Team America. Team America did something right here. But the anti, anti-Serbian, anti you know. Like, yeah, I like, do. Yeah. No, you're right. I do have, like, anti-Serb bigotry. Because, like, the Serbs were like, no, everybody's got to stay in the Yugoslavia. And everybody's yeah, got like, to defer Croat, to us. And the Croats were, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the Croats okay. were like, and you have, you, and you have, me. And also you have Croat ancestry. Or you don't. Or you don't. Uh, actually, ch- yeah. So not crow out. All right. Well, check check your privilege. Well, that's America. <laughs> that's America being the good guy. But I had to do it. I had to do it. That's America being a good guy, by the way, because there, you know, again, it's kind of like the roof Ish. knocking with Israel and Palestine. Anyway, going on to the next super chat. Uh, yeah, wait till we get on that one. That little number. Colin, five dollars. Counterpoints hasn't hasn't watched Life of Brian or read Slaughterhouse Five. Bro, you caught me. Bro, can we ban this guy? Can we just? Like, I'm sorry. Like, you know, he's got a few more super high. chats in here. I'm not gonna ban him. Mike, fine. you caught me. Mike donated 9.99. What are your thoughts on geopolitical strategist Peter Zihan about the end of globalism and the demographic collapse? Could we see the end of Russia and China this decade? What does that mean for the USA? I think all of these super chats are like episodes in and of themselves. So I wonder yeah, like how much, much time. We can uh, put on them. Uh, Colin, $5 counterpoint. See, you seriously believe that we as Americans can achieve self... Well, that's like the whole Masonic plan, isn't it? You know, like to, you know, know thyself through the process. Of... Anyway, I'm not going to get into that yeah. right now. Uh, I'm feeling ba- your power level now. I'm in, yeah. a, I'm in a room with a Mason and a Jew. 
Mm. Bear, uh, yeah, uh, okay. Barrett Williamson, five dollars. May the truth set us free. The U R book came out choice. Hashtag mold bug mafia. Yeah, I saw Indian Bronson. He was um, uh, he was showing off your book it's in nice, Manhattan. It's a, nice, it's a nice, it's a nice edition. It's really like good, yeah, good design is really it's very pretty. Uh, Everybody, get, and Bowen, yeah. Yeah, get that book. I want to get Lomez on soon, and I want her to team him up with somebody a little bit more liberal. So we're we're working on it. Uh, Aaron Ma- Manger or Muncher or Manger, uh, French. I don't know. Five dollars. Manger. Uh, could the Democrats say it do is better? A French accent. Manger. Manger. <laughs> say, no, say the question in a French accent. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> could the Democrats uh, do better <laughs> than Biden on this issue with a different candidate? And what would the Trump win in 2024 mean for Ukraine? <laughs> oh, okay. okay, I'm going to answer this first because you guys genius. are I can see why fun. you do this job, Lev. You're so, so good. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, there could be a better Democrat who does a better job. But then the problem is that, like, I don't think there's anybody with that big of name recognition. So, like, you know, they're going to have to, like, duct, tri- duct tape Biden's corpse to, like, a fucking dolly and just, like, wheel him out to speeches and shit and give him, like, human growth hormone and fucking amphetamines before he gives speeches. I think that's the route that they're going at this point. Um, and then when it comes to who could do it, like, I think Pete Buter, Buttigieg, but judge, I think he could do it, but to quote Obama, he's too, he's too short and he's too gay. So like, you know, I don't think that like the American populace is ready for a gay president. I don't think it's going to happen. What if he's really tall, but you know, the, the, uh, uh, (laughs) what if he's like a super tall giant? Don't you Russians have this surgery where you break your, break the legs to make it taller? What if, what if, what if the butt judge is like basically having that surgery right now? Yeah. Yeah. So if he, if he does that and then he prays the the leg upward a little bit, right. Yeah. And then, and yeah, then so if he, that's right. Conversion yeah, therapy. If he wears right, you platforms, know, can, he travels to Indiana. He could marry, he he to... could marry a woman. He could even marry Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Never mind. But, uh, <laughs> oh man, don't, don't then you start. Win. Don't you start with that. Okay. Uh, Muzio Ske. Vo- oh, no, no. Before him, we got a, a Chase T. $5 nice. from Fukayu Sugma. Do inherent differences in people affect the type of governance people need? If so, uh, doesn't that give pause to universal liberalism? I would say real quick that when it comes to Islam, I could be completely talking out of my ass here, but I think there is some passage where Muhammad talks about the Arabians being good for Islam and kind of working for them, and Mm. I'm not sure if it would work for... I mean, that's... Yeah. That that is going to be the main problem is, so for instance, like, you know, we're we're getting a lot of in, you know, the Western world, we're getting a lot of mileage out of render unto Caesar what is Caesar and render unto God what is God. So we're getting a whole lot of mileage out of that, you know, one statement. Um, but there's a lot of people that just don't view theocracy badly at all. Um, sure, so I, I, think, I, yeah. I do I do think it's going to be I think you can do like Islamic republics where like, uh, you know, the the country is guided by the religion, but not fully like a, a theocracy. But I, I still think it's going to be hmm. tough. Um, well, that I was. Find, I find the useful way to think about this question is basically like Pokemon eugenics. Like you imagine, can you is, imagine Islamic Mexico? Can you imagine like Mexico becoming like fully Islamic? Right. You know, theocracy. it's an interesting question. I can, like, I can imagine know, it being a Christian theocracy. But Islamic, I, you know, I don't know, no. just reflecting on what exactly what Muhammad said. It's just it doesn't feel right. I don't really know what's wrong. Not unless it. everybody it converts. Islam doesn't yeah. feel right for Mexicans. So, yeah. you know, It'll basically, that's forever. the kind of like Pokemon yeah. eugenics. I mean, at the I, same I, time, I though, you have you have Arabian Christians who act very differently than Arabian Muslims do. And they have a different culture. And I think really culture mean. is kind of. Yeah, yeah they do. It, culture, I think, is kind of key here. Because when it comes to that whole thing about me being an outsider that I said before, counterpoints, you're right on your point. Only thing I wanted to add there is that when it comes to the various cultures throughout the world, I think the main concern is going to be to make sure that the countries that are already civilized, however you want to define that, they're not going to be taken over by an oppressive ideology, by some dictatorship that they have zero in common with. 
Unfortunately, there are going to be countries out there that are going to have to be under the thumb of some iron-fisted dictator because, frankly, I don't think we have the time or the resources like a lot of these uh, pie-in-the-sky people think, <laughs> you know, to go everywhere and to institute our system there. But for the people like the Ukrainians, I'd say, who are way, way, way more civilized in terms of their history, their culture, uh, it's a different story for me. That's like I, I don't I don't know I don't know if I buy onto the this like civilized thing. Um, the only reason why is because like when you look at like uh, China or Islam or you know, and, like when I say Islam, I just mean like the the Ummah, the, the caliphates of like the world or whatever. A lot of these places were considered like the peak of civilization at their at their nadir at their at their top. Yeah, and then on top of that, there there is like a uh, precedent for like kind of like a, a moderate form of Islam while still creating like a theocratic society. Um, so for instance, like there, there was like a Muslim ruler who ruled like Northern India with a good degree of tolerance for a long time. The, the Mughal problem, empire, they were yeah, Iranians. The, they were Iranians. Yeah, it's a the, different culture. The, the only problem of course, being that basically uh, after that, a different uh, you know, a different Muslim guy who was a lot more uh, less tolerant of pagans and atheists basically came in and butchered everybody, including the Muslims who tolerated the pagans and atheists. That was uh, um, Timur, so, I believe. Yeah. 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 So, 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 so basically, like, it, it's possible, but then it's also possible that you'll always have that one guy who shows up and be like, well, you're not, you know, faithful enough. You're not strong enough. So I'm going to kill everybody like that's. Yeah, that's well, that's not an example of a good civilization, one that goes and just barbarizes and kills everybody. That's what I'm but, against. But neither. But th this is some one of the things that I would um, I agree with Curtis on, though, is like neither is a civilization that is so weak that it allows the strong man to come in in the first place. I that agree. Why, I this agree. Is why, that's this the, is why the war, problem with war is the health the of the place. state, right? You know, sure. And this is why <clears throat> when you try to abolish war, like you just get really bad results, mm. right? You know. Well, again, I'm not talking about civilized being being a fucking pussy. In fact, I'd say that being a fucking I, pussy means that the kind of freedom that you have is freedom to just like jerk off to internet porn all day. It's not being free. It's actually being subservient to your animal desire. So in a way, you decivilize yeah. yourself through that process. But anyway, that's like a whole other thing. Uh, Muzio Skevola, five dollars. <laughs> Russian Russia Germany alliance is the biggest fear of the Anglo's. <laughs> Molotov Ribbentrop was the death sentence of Hitler. No, true. I mean, uh, I, I literally think that Russian coming into the fold of like the European Union and NATO and all that kind of stuff. Like, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of sad um, at the lost op opportunity of always seeing them like an enemy and another like that. I, I think it's a huge missed opportunity. Hashtag I me too. I think Russia should just get to be Russia. I th also think the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact was an intentional trap laid by Stalin for Hitler. That's, you know, comes mm. close to the the thesis of Sean McMeekin in Stalin's War, which I think everyone should read. I was also about to ask you, Lev, do you know the works of Lev uh, and Andrei Navrozov? The autobiography of Lev Navrozov in particular? No, yeah, I but see. I know Alexander Navzorov, who's a friend of uh, ours, but that's a different thing, right? Navrozov, I think, Yeah, Navzorov. Okay, but, uh, yeah, different these thing. Are, you know, great works, you should check them out. Well, you should check out Alexander Nevzorov. Perhaps I can get the two of you to meet. He does not speak any English, though, so it's going to be a little mm, tough, but who knows? Maybe, tough. Yeah, maybe yeah, we can work yeah. it out somehow. Anyway, Rhodes, uh, 9.99. Does <laughs> Curtis expect to have future engagements with uh, Thaddeus Russell? Uh, well, I don't know. He seems fine. Like, uh, he's kind of more of a libertarian than me, but I don't... Hold, I don't cancel people. I, I wouldn't cancel someone for being a libertarian. It's or maybe having been a libertarian in the past. It's a little cringe, but I used to be a libertarian. You know, it's just like being a libertarian. We, is like we, we you all off start on it. You know, like yeah, it's, it's, no, we we all start with uh, hey, bro, why don't you just do what you do and I just do what I yeah, do and yeah, we all yeah. get along, bro. Like we've all we've all done that shit. Mm. Yeah. But also, don't charge me taxes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, Harry Dubois donated. IDR one hundred thousand dollars. Now, before we get excited, that's <laughs> that's six seventy six dollars. So six dollars nice. seventy six cents. So good. I mean, look, I'm not gonna be like fucking Stefan Molyneux and say, uh, you know, the whole thing. That's like, oh, six dollars more than you had. 
That's right. Exactly. That's right. That's right. We got to be grateful. Uh, Barrett. Uh, oh yeah. Well, I'm gonna read a super chat now. Looking at Salvador, does Curtis think Bukele's method would work effectively in, for example, Los Angeles? Well, I mean, you've got the fact, the remarkable fact that in Salvador, basically, as far as I can determine, um, if you're a, in a gang, you have a gang tattoo. And if you're not in a gang, you don't have a gang tattoo. And, you know, the thing is, does that make the game a little too easy? Like, arguably, right. I would say that makes the game a little too easy. You know, like, good for Salvador that they did that, you know. But uh, the, like um so it's a little bit harder but it's not you know suppressing disorder is like very basic for a government if you have places in the country where like a decent person can't walk at any time of day or night you've got something really really wrong with the way that country mm. is governed like it's not good I, uh, I agree there. I just don't like the deterioration that may happen with the dictator, but that's a conversation for next time. You know, you're just like, you, you know you have the cancer, but you don't want to take the chemo. I mean, you know, Steve Jobs was like that. You know, eventually he, you know, he wanted these natural remedies. Eventually he changed his mind. He did get the chemo. But it was too late, and I worry well, that it's too late for you, love. Sometimes the cure is worse than the sickness, but that's, again, we're going to talk about that a little later in detail. Mike... Oh, uh, before Mike, we have Barrett. Barrett Melton, $5. Uh, Curtis, best book you'd recommend on America's slow motion coupe, as you put it, taking us from Gilded Age to New Deal. Ooh, well, uh, you know, I honestly... Um, I just don't know that there are really any very good books on the subject of history i might actually unqualified you know, reservations i know uh, i might actually recommend john dos passos washington trilogy which is the ones he wrote after he was canceled for dropping out of the communist party so if you read a book called the grand design it's kind of a romana clef of the new deal and really gives you I mean, he knew all the people there really gives you a sense of what it was like to be part of that shit, but, uh, you know, it's not, it's a book, a work of fiction, of course, but I, I think it kind of tells a good story. Mm. And two last super chats, one for Mike, nine ninety nine. love should shave or grow a beard. This stubble is weak. Looks like Ben Shapiro. All right, listen, it was really nice this last past week. I shaved it because I wanted to go to the beach and absorb all the salt, and it was great. In fact, today, I was on the beach today. I don't know if you could say I got a little, a little tan here, and the weather was perfect, and the water was super cold, and it was great. So I'm officially one of the polar bear people now, part of the polar bears club. I swim in extremely cold water, and it's good for you. And I drink raw milk, and I slonk the eggs. Anyway, final super chat but of the night. But do you yes. sun your – never mind. <laughs> in fact you know what one of the guests who i really want to bring on btr and i've been in touch with her through instagram is this lady named metaphysic metaphysical metaphysical megan who if you look up metaphysical megan you're going to find that she was the lady who was sunning where the sun don't shine completely naked out in the desert and that's what made her famous and she's all mm. about health and like drinking the right kind of water and she always like she tested coconut water and found out that like the commercially available coconut water is actually really toxic for you so she's like super high hippie level of uh, s scientific knowledge when it comes to health so she's She's definitely an interesting person to talk to. E girls, man. Indeed. <laughs> Dissident right. Nine ninety nine. Curtis has written blueprints for how Republicans could have legally installed Trump as Caesar on Gray Mirror and still can. But their lazy readers are too weak to do it. Uh, lazy readers or leaders? Okay, or lazy readers or too weak to do it. Very cool. Very legal act soon. Well, that's not really a question, man. Like, I don't know. Like, if you have a question, you should yeah, ask but it's, it. Yeah, but like, it's nine ninety nine. Well, yeah. Okay. You well, you know, like I don't know. Like, um, I feel like I, I'm sort of being asked to like do like the Papa John, like the reckoning is coming, like you know, act. I don't think the reckoning is coming, but like I don't know, maybe it'll come. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Listen, everybody. Before we go. Um, 
uh, tell us what you're going to be doing, what you're up to, uh, what do we have to look forward to. Let's start with the great and powerful counterpoints, Connor. Yeah, so uh, 95% of my channel views, 95% of my views are Warhammer 40k related. So basically, if you're into grim dark fantasy or grim dark science fiction, I, I still think it's space fantasy, not necessarily science fiction. But if you're into uh, gritty, visceral violence and all that kind of stuff, I, I try to bring my military experience and law enforcement experience and political and psychological experience to uh, breakdowns of the television shows. Um, that seems to be doing pretty well on my primary channel. And then if you're into more of the political stuff or Twitch or YouTube debates, I'm running a panel show uh, every other Friday night called The Heated Hippie. Um, so if you're into a bunch of autistic spurgs yelling at each other for two hours, then you might enjoy that program. And then also on the side, I do little essays and stuff. So for instance, uh, if you're familiar with the streamer personality Destiny, um, I did mm. a 30 minute rant about his relational dynamics and the Mr. Girl drama and how he kind of got canceled for having all these fucked up relationships um, and how people are attracted to the clout and the money and the time and the attention, but they don't want to pay the price of notoriety and public humiliation and all of the things that can and like the doxing and the harassing that can come with public debate. Um, so if you're an aspiring public debater, an aspiring public speaker, or if you're into Twitch and YouTube politics, you should check that out as well. That's on my second channel, uh, the Counterpoints Coliseum. So either Counterpoints 30K, soon to be 40K, because we're about to hit 40,000 subscribers, and the Woo! universe I'm into is Warhammer 40,000, um, and then Counterpoints Coliseum, where we do, uh, chances are I'll... Uh, I'll give you a couple of weeks to have some uh, metrics on this video, and then I'm going to download it and po post this to uh, Counterpoints Coliseum. Because every who who doesn't? What what did you say about Curtis? The you had like something that rhymed about his name where they were they were starving for, the, for Yar starving for Yarvin. Yarvin. Yeah, there you go. So uh, <laughs> I, I'll I'll try to I'll try to satiate the people's hunger on my channel as well. Nice. And listen, Destiny, if you're watching this, come on, BTR. It's enough already. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. You know, I was I was scheduled. There was this kind of shitty event <clears throat> in Texas, you know, where mm -hmm. I was scheduled to debate Destiny. But, uh, you know, he uh, he never showed, uh, which was sad. But, you know, the event was maybe a little substandard. So, uh, you know, Destiny, what a name, Destiny, if you're out there, like... I'm just remembering another friend of mine who had this amazing story about a black stripper named Destiny. <laughs> so they kind of get, get mixed yeah, up a little Destiny in my head, you know. Name. But it's like true. Destiny, yeah. I love you, Destiny. And, you know, um, I think absolutely thank you for, you know, touting your channel, CP. I think everyone should go ape for CP. <laughs> uh, I don't know how, if you're into Warhammer 40K, like you don't understand some of these things we've gone over today. But, uh, uh -huh. seem, uh, you know, um, um, but I long love the Space Marines. Uh, maybe they can pull Europe, clean up uh, LA one of these days. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, writing, I'm about to issue a uh, another chapter, really a first redone chapter of my actual Grey Mirror book on graymirror.substack.com. That's Grey with an A, the American way. And otherwise, uh, you know, having uh, fucked up relationships and uh, raising children and uh, all these great things. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, for your time and for uh, watching this crazy experience. And thank you, CP and Lev. Thank you guys so much. And before we go, once again, follow me on Twitter at LevePo. Be sure to knock the hell out of that subscribe button. I'm sure a lot of you are not subscribed yet. Subscribe right now to the greatest podcast show of all time. We, are, we bring all the people together from different social circles. And be sure to click the bell. I know not a lot of you have clicked the bell. So do it right now. I'm patiently waiting. Go to that bell. Click the bell right now. Do it now. And lastly, well, second to last, pay patreon.com slash break the rules become a patron today and you are going to get a lot of wonderful things including these beautiful beautiful magnets which are on the screen right now created by my father alexander polyakov they're made out of high quality wood and for 50 dollar patronage you guys are going to have a custom magnet of whatever you want within well within limits of course uh reasonable limits here and uh yeah so that's the patreon and final thing is i have started a substack called levpo.com substack.com that's the link but the actual name is lev's lens and my recent article talks about the cartoonification of our political system talking about elsa gate i don't know curtis have you heard about elsa gate i haven't heard about elsa gate 
It was back in the day where on uh, YouTube, a lot of these uh, algorithm-focused um, cartoons ended up coming out, which had not only like Spider-Man and Elsa from uh, Frozen and the Hulk and all that stuff, but also they had like abortions and needles and like all of this sick shit because apparently a lot of these kids that were clicking, they were very absorbed by all this weird, freaky, you know, horrible stuff. But YouTube put a stop to that. But what they did not put a stop to so far are the incredibly bright colors that you would see in a lot of these so-called kid-friendly YouTube channels with, like, finger family nursery rhymes and bullshit like that. So a lot of these kids that are growing up right now, they're watching the most horrible, robotic, AI-created stuff instead of, like, I don't know, Bugs Bunny. And I think it messes up their mind to the extent that in the future we're going to have a politician that's going to have to play by that same algorithmic game of being, you know, super i don't even know how to describe it just like super basic and yeah, yeah mm -hmm. but not just attention grabbing because that's kind of a given with politicians in general <laughs> but just using no, like super baby yeah. yeah oh I, yeah i like i like i like i like that you're you know lev you know it's like when your prophecy is not coming from a place of hope <laughs> I, I just like it better <laughs> Yeah, I, lo I love how you try to pull the wool off of my eyes made me, like, legitimately hate the world infinitely more than I already did. And, like, so, so I, had, I had this... Let, let, I, I just want to point this out. Like, yeah. I already had a cynical worldview that most people view as, like, really dark and fucked up, which is, like, it's a bunch of nepotism and elbow rubbing and rich fat cats manipulating the public and private sphere so they can profit off of each other and all that kind of shit. And Curtis over here is, like, yeah, maybe, but that's like one one millionth of it. Nine, you know, ninety nine point nine 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 percent repeating is these idealistic fucking retards who are watching diplomatic TV shows from thirty years ago, who are trying to like force the world into their idealistic worldview, and as a result, they're getting hundreds of thousands of people killed, which to me is like more depressing. Yeah, basically. But I think that there is a way to fix it, or at least to fix the whole cartoonification that's going on. And in order to find out, you got to subscribe to my Substack, and I'm going to be releasing new editions. Uh, uh, it's going to be like on a bi-weekly or maybe even a tri-weekly basis, if you're lucky. I'm going to be doing a write-up of this conversation as well to get more people to uh, get in there. And guys, that's it. That's the end of the show.